Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey guys, welcome to episode 165 of the Team House. We're here tonight with Nicholas Moore. He is the author of Run to the Sound of Guns. He served in 2nd Ranger Battalion uh, from the ranks of private to platoon sergeant, over a thousand missions and 13 combat deployments uh, where he was wounded. He was involved in some very significant operations from uh, Jessica Lynch to Extortion 17 to Operation Red Wings, the recovery, um, to numerous other things that we'll get into tonight. So, Nicholas, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, dude. Really appreciate you uh, taking some uh, some of your Friday to speak with us. Uh, no worries. So, let's start off, man. Start. We'll start start at the beginning, the beginning of the story. If you could tell us a little bit about uh, sort of where you grew up and and why you ended up in the military and why in Ranger Battalion. <laughs> uh, so, I grew up in uh, Newton, Kansas. Um, and, you know, um, just trying to figure out, you know, what to do. And I thought, you know, college sucks, but um, if I join the army and I want to go to school and, you know, I serve, then I can don't have to take a student loan and I can go and it's all good. And, you know, some of us do it and end up going to school and some of us don't. And we just end up staying <laughs> in the military. But the the whole thing was, you know, I had a recruiter, you know, uh, that just based on the lifestyle that we had, you know, playing sports and being active and out outdoor activities, hunting, fishing, all that stuff. He goes, man, you'll, you guys will love the army. Um, but, uh, you'll never be happy if you don't pursue the, the ranger regiment. And so, you know, that was kind of, well, what's that? And, you know, <laughs> so you do a little bit of research and you're like, okay, well, that's definitely what I want to do. And so, you know, you go do it and, and, you know, there's the old, the old mantra that goes with it, you know, as you continue to, to be in the Ranger Regiment, what have you done for the Ranger Regiment today? So, you know, there's always that little aspect, that, you know, as your career progresses through, you know, it's always trying to to better, you know, the, the organization as a whole. Yeah. Did you, did, was any of your family in the military? Was it something that you had been exposed to earlier than that? Or like, or is it just kind of, it seemed pragmatic at the time? No, um, my grandfather's both, both my grandfather served in World War II. And then, you know, we've had, you know, family members in the military, but mostly it's always been in the Navy. And uh, uh, I had an aunt who served in the Air Force back in the late 70s, I think. And, um, you know, but no, nobody really in the Army, except for uh, my grandfather's brothers, you know, they were in uh, the army in world war ii but you know it's we're basically a navy family and then me and my brother decided we were both going to join the army and be rangers and um you know so it, it was fun uh you know that part of it my grandpa didn't talk to me for like three weeks because he was mad really we didn't join the navy okay <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. how, how, so you and your brother, did you like have the same like entry date into the army? I mean, was it that close? Yeah, we're, we're identical twins. So we graduated oh, wow. school and went through uh, basic training, airborne school, RIP, and then got stationed together. Um, so we did it all together all the way until, um, oh, I think, 04, 05. And then he went down to, uh, his wife got restationed to Martin Army at Fort Benning. And so he went down to be a, a rip instructor and and that's kind of where our careers split apart i stayed at second and then he moved down to third for a while and, and then you know uh went and did his, some time in the big army and finished his career as an rotc instructor at the university of kansas so what at that time um just to hit it up a little bit um going through basic training airborne school what was the rip experience like but that was 1999 pre pre 9-11 before the war kicked off uh what was it like going right. through rip during that time frame uh you know it's uh i don't know if it's better or worse because you now i think about it and you're just like god would i want to sit and do that for eight weeks <laughs> the whole rasp you know it was thing, uh yeah. yeah the whole rasp thing it's like wow um no but it would i had a i had a lot of fun there wasn't really a lot of my ranger experiences that i didn't like you know, some of them good, some of them bad, but they're all memories. And, you know, 
um, just just kind of fun, you know. It's always that that mental challenge through some of the things, you know. Is can I make it to the end? And you know, when you do, you're you're a better human for it, and you're a better ranger all the way around. And you have you know a starting point to learn what suck is. Yeah. So you get out of rip and you go to the best company in the best battalion. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Right. Bico 275. Yeah. Right. Yep. Bico 275 went to first platoon. Yeah. My brother went to third. And um, so that was always fun. I mean, it was always, you know, all the way up until we both got our tabs, you know, it was just, you know, who's got the better twin and they were always, you know, <laughs> putting us, pitting us against each other. And so it was, you know, it's nothing changed from school or, you know, sports. And so it's just, you know, so no, two, seven, five, uh, some, some, something different between two, seven, five and, and three, seven, five. And I believe one, seven, five is you guys all have platoon names and three, seven, not five, every platoon, but yeah. And three, seven, five, I think my platoon was the only one that had a name, but I, I'd like to hear what your platoon name was and, and how it got that name. Um, well, one Bravo, it was eventually, it became the sea bass. Okay. And it was just, uh, you know, it was at the same, right. We, they tagged it right at, you know, um, uh, Afghanistan was just cranking off and Austin powers had just come out and it was, you know, our PL was calling us a bunch of mutant sea bass. And so it just kind of <laughs> stuck. And so that was that. And then, um, you know, I was in one Bravo till I, um, uh, Till oh th- in the uh, middle of 03, and then I went over to three Charlie, and uh, uh, stayed there till oh eight. So you uh, you actually were in Ranger School during nine eleven, right? Yeah. So how did that? Yeah, that was down a, for you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things. You know, sometimes you you're like, now nah, this can't really be happening, and um, we just thought it was some kind of weird you know, mo- false motivational thing that the RIs were doing. We weren't, you know, nobody was really sure if it was something that everybody was, you know, accustomed to in every class that, you know, oh, you got to hurry up because, you know, the army, the country's going to war and all this stuff. But what kind of struck at home was, you know, when they came out and they asked people if they had family that worked at World Trade Centers and, um, you know, you kind of get the weird look like, why are you asking that? And then, you know, 45 minutes or so later, you know, hey, does anybody have parents that work at the Pentagon? And, you know, everybody's like, well, why would I raise my hand? I don't want to get singled out for right. something. And, you know, then they're kind of like, hey, no, this is, you know, serious. And they realized that we weren't believing them. And so they kind of called a couple of guys to, to go forward and just kind of see the news feed on the on a TV and for about five minutes and then kind of came back and said, Hey, they're not lying. It's, this is real. And so we had one guy raise his hand and say, yeah, my dad works at the Pentagon. And, um, you know, they said, well, you need to call him. And so that really messed with him. It was a kid out of three, seven, five. And, uh, luckily his dad was out of the office. I think he was at Fort Lee, Virginia that day. But he, uh, you know, when he came back to work on the 12th, he didn't have an office. Holy shit. Yeah. And then how much, so how far into ranger school were you and how much longer did you have to go and how did that affect ranger school? <laughs> uh, well, you know, you were basically uh day two. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, we had just done the PT test and that morning we just finished the, uh, the five mile run. And uh, so it, uh, it was, um, it was interesting because you, know, you always hear the stories of guys, you know, you got to get, you know, 70% of your patrols, you got to pass. Well, I mean, at that point they were, you know, the, the RIs knew the writing on the wall. And they, so the whole point was to get the guys back to the units as fast as possible. So you pass one patrol and you never got another one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then it, uh, it became guys that failed patrols, you know, it was putting the right guys in positions to help them get the next patrol to pass so that they could go on to the next phase so that guys aren't stuck, you know, playing the, how many months can I be in ranger school game right. and, um, and graduate and then get back to your units because we got to go do business. Right. Yeah. Uh, did you have any of those guys in when you were, when you were doing a Jack where they just assigned like four, four bat guys to them and just say, 
he's going to pass his patrol, so you basically don't let him make any decisions. I, I probably was that guy going through his, like, <laughs> as an E2, had been in battalion for, like, two months. I think I was that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but where, where they basically give you the reins and yeah. say, get this guy through this patrol. Right. You know, it, you know it's, it, it's not to pick on people, but it's usually the, the young lieutenants that, that yeah. are just still trying to get their feet underneath them as, you know, what it's like to be a leader. And, and yeah. you know, we've got, you know, guys from the Ranger Regiment been there 12, 18 months. You know, some guys that got hurt, you know, maybe 24 months of experience and they kind of understand the game. So, you know, yeah. let's just turn them loose. And yeah. So you were uh, you were in Ranger school when the first actions when when. Afghanistan kicked off, right? Like the, the yeah, first... we were, uh, yeah, we were, uh, just finishing up mountains, uh, when, when everything kicked off and, uh, we were getting graded patrols and who was going to go to Florida. And it just happened to be the night that 375 jumped on Rhino and the RIs wheeled the TV cart out and said, Hey, check this out. And, uh, all the guys from 375 are crying and the guys from first and second are laughing and the guys from third are like, why are you? You know why are you laughing? It's not funny. We're not a part of this, and it's like, well, guess what? Our battalions haven't gone yet. Yeah, yeah. Were you worried that that it was going to be like another? I'm going to uh, miss the war, bro. Yeah, that it was going to be like Desert Storm. It was going to be over before you were out of Ranger School. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of us that were. You know, it was going to be the traditional like Grenada, Panama, Desert Storm, where it's going to be over as fast as it started, and uh, you know, you're going to miss it all, and um. But you know when you when you start thinking about the the amount of time that it was going to take to to put everything over there, you know, and get it in place, it was just a matter of you know when when's it going to be our turn, and is there going to be anything left? Because the regiment's going to rotate everybody through at least once. And right, right. So you graduate Ranger School, and how how was your reception when you got back to Second Bat? What was going on at the time? Oh, everybody had just gotten back from uh, Yakima. So it was kind of a, I got back like 24 hours before the battalion rolled back in from doing, you know, all the big fun stuff over in Yakima. And, um, you know, it was just kind of figuring out, you know, how the rotation was going to work because, you know, 175 was just gearing up to go. And so we were trying to figure out what our training schedule was going to be and what it was going to look like. And then when was our window going to come to to go? And was there still going to be anything to do when we got there? Yeah. Um, you know, and then 20 years later, it's still going on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. When, when did you get the word that you guys were heading over and like, what, what was it like jocking up for that deployment and getting ready to go out the door? Um, we got kind of got the word that we were still going to get to go is probably, uh, in late November, December, you know, 175 is going to go and then it's going to be our turn to go. And, you know, it might be the only deployment that we get in Afghanistan. But, you know, it's right as it stands right now. Um, you know, we saw to go do uh, rotary wing um, bilats and and all the, the training that, you know, was normally, you know, gearing up for for all that stuff. And um, so, you know, we did. And then uh, Biko. Biko led the the push for second battalion because at that time it was um uh basically you know there was only the need for like basically one company um we were still sitting you know split between Kandahar and Bagram and that was about it and then um you know everybody realized that this was gonna be the long fight and so then we started uh kind of pushing out and doing the expansion for the American footprint and setting up bases and, and all that stuff. And that's kind of what we ended up doing our first deployment. And then after we'd been there for oh, I don't know, uh, maybe a month or so, they rolled in with the rest of the battalion. So ACO and Seco came in and, and kind of helped expand the the footprint and all the the fun. So what but, was you it? know like well, yeah post Taku Gar. Post Taku Gar and, you know, at Operation Anaconda, there really was nothing going on in Afghanistan. You know, it was basically, you know, when you look at what was going on, you know, you hear about 175 and Roberts Ridge and then 375 is jumping on Rhino and doing all that stuff. And, you know, we're going over there thinking, you know, it's going to be game on. It's spring, summer, and everybody's going to be fighting. And that was, you know, complete opposite. You know, let's say we're just as much as we were trying to, feel out you know what was going on with the Taliban you know they're kind of sitting back on the border and just watching you know how we're doing business yeah 
So that first deployment was like pretty relatively quiet at the time. Yeah, I mean, we did uh, one. There was one operation where you know they got it. The platoon got in a gunfight. I was on a fifty cal, so um, I didn't didn't get to be you know on the ground for that one. But it was one engagement, lasted five seconds, and that was it. Yeah, and the rest um, of the deployment was just setting up bases and driving around Afghanistan and Humvees. Oh yeah, you mentioned. Uh, I forgot you mentioned in your book that you actually had a. Uh, a guide, a tourist guide, and uh, a ranger who had been a Russian in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah there was a kid in, uh, well, not a kid, but, you know, there was a guy in third platoon that it was, um, you, I, I believe he was Ukrainian, but, you know, it was part of the Soviet bloc at the time. And he was you know, like 18, 19 and got conscripted into the Red Army. And, you know, he spent a year in Afghanistan in like 88, 89, right when they were shutting it down. But it was really cool because, you know, at the time, you know, he could tell you what everything was on, on Bagram, you know, all the remnants of what was left. So that was, I mean, for a history lesson, that was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's pretty surreal. So, so that was sort of your, your first trip. It was just, you know, um, setting the footprint. There wasn't a lot of activity. Um, what happened then after that, you went back and reset and what was your kind of time between the deployments looking like at this point? Uh, you know, so we, we went back and reset and that was kind of when everybody was thinking that, you know, this is basically a wrap up and, you know, we're, we're not going to be involved in this anymore, but, you know, all the battalions got at least one deployment and, um, you know, 375 came back over and ripped us. And, you know, so when it came time, you know, throughout the year that it was, we were going to at least go one more time. It was, um, you know, Iraq was ramping up. And so it was like, okay, well, who's going to go to Afghanistan? And so Charlie Company got picked to go to Afghanistan. And the whole preface was for them to go was to shut down the uh, special ops, you know, footprint over there. And then kind of if things did crank off in Iraq, then they were going to join us over in Iraq. And, uh, you know, they ended up staying for six months. You know, they did their three month deployment plus the Iraq and you know and stuff so they got stuck in afghanistan for six months so let's just say manning retention and charlie company was terrible after everybody got home yeah yeah so then you guys were working up toward uh towards the invasion of iraq right which was that that was right. march of 2003 so did yeah. were you guys part of that initial invasion or did you get there shortly after it um we uh, the, the battalion was infilling, you know, shortly before everything cranked off, but we didn't actually put wheels down, you know, uh, over there until the night that it officially cranked off okay. because we got, I had a bird, we are bird broke in Germany. Uh, what, what uh, was, but, you know, it's always no. kind of one of those, those fun things are, you know, uh, uh, riding in on the C-17, you got your gas mask strapped to your hip and you're wearing your mop suit. Right. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about what a mop suit is for the people who might not be familiar with it? It's a uh, the chemical suit that you have to wear. And, you know, it's a charcoal lined suit and it's, uh, for uh, gas and biological weapons and stuff. It's going to help keep it off your skin. And they're terrible to wear. Yeah, they uh, they're, they're like hot they're, in the, they're hot in the daylight and cold in the at night. Yeah. Yeah. They trap air. They're basically like sweats like the plastic suits that you used to wear for wrestling or whatever, like they, they're not comfortable at all. Uh, no. Yeah. Um, so when you guys, because your bird got hung up in, in Germany, when you landed for the invasion, did you guys go to Saudi or did you go, did you go someplace else for, since you were, no, we of, landed in Saudi. Okay. So, you know, every, everywhere where the, the special ops footprint was during Desert Storm is the same place that we went to and, um, you know, basically basically unloaded and then just uh, got everything set. And I think within a, a couple of days, we were running cross-border ops out in the West. Yeah. And so then what was that like for you, like moving into, you know, from Saudi into Iraq and what kind of vehicles were you guys in and, and what were the lives operations uh, We were like? just, you know, we were running the, uh, light, the soft skin you know, Humvee gun trucks, we'd skin the roofs off and taking the windows out, which was stupid. 
um because we caught one of the sandstorms right after it happened and i know uh purple team got caught out in it in the trucks and no windshields and they're trying to hold mre boxes up over their face to keep rocks from blowing in and you know nobody can see anything so they're stuck sitting out there in it until the sun comes up and then they can at least try and attempt to get back and so it was interesting you know we had 550 cord from all the the tents to the latrines and to the chow hall so the guys could follow the string and and you know walk around in the brown out yeah yeah those, those sandstorms were something else out there uh and then uh so how long was your trip to iraq and like where it was did anything particularly notable happen during during your tour there uh not not in the first part of it you know until everything came down for uh for us to do the Jessica Lynch uh, rescue. And we had just rolled in off of like a 24 hour op to uh, go tie in with 375 and help them come back from H1 uh, where they where they jumped in and then bring their vehicle convoys back. Um, so we drove out, tied in with them and then brought this like five mile long convoy back across the border. And then you know, we were rolling in dog tired and the commander comes out of his tent and he's like, hey, pack your stuff, we're leaving in three hours and we're gonna go do this. And I was like, oh, that's funny. And, but seriously, you know, folks. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a stupid E4. What do I know that the commander's not just, you know, not being a, a jerk and and trying to get guys to have some kind of false motivation because you know we, you know, get in dog tired and throw down on the cot and start cleaning your rifle and squad leader comes back in. He's like, no, pack your stuff because we're out of here. Yeah. And were you guys aware of Jessica Lynch of that whole situation at the time, or was the mission? No, I mean. No, we hadn't really gotten any. I mean, we kind of got like a, a little brief of it, but the the kind of the uh, the you know kind of the 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 awe of the whole thing was like, how in the heck does a maintenance company get ahead of the front line? Yeah, you know, it's like the the unfathomable. You know, how does this happen? It's you know, we start kind of spitballing this whole thing, and you you start you know, talking to some of the maintenance units that are out there and they just, you know, at the time they weren't equipped with night vision at the time. They're still driving, you know, blackout lights and the way that, you know, that everybody has since World War II, it's just slow moving and trying to navigate. And, you know, only the combat arms units have night vision because that's the priority. Um, right. So, you know, it's just kind of like, how does this even happen? Yeah. And so what was what was the mission as as it was briefed to you guys? What was your role and what was the overall effort? Um, we were gonna set in as far as Bravo Company's part of it, you know, we were gonna infill on Marine Corps 46s on the west side of Nazaria, um, kind of on this flat, looked like a kind of a trash pit area on the west side of town. And then we were just gonna run in a few blocks off the desert and establish blocking positions around the the hospital while uh, 175, a company from 175 was going to skirt all the way around on the east and then come in from the north and then bring in the, you know, the big guns on the trucks and um, just basically, you know, lock it all down until we had gotten her out and gotten confirmation and recovery of uh, everybody else that was off those trucks. And uh, I was, we were only on the ground for like three and a half hours and it was all done. Yeah. I mean, by the time the SEALs came in on the hospital and did the whole, uh, you know, recovery of her, we had just basically put the blocking positions on the ground. We hadn't even gotten them established yet as far as how fast that, that whole thing happened. It was a matter of just moments. Yeah. And, uh, cause, um, uh, you know, but it was fun. Um, you know, it was, it was fun to be a part of it. And, you know, like I, we were saying earlier, it says, you know, there's all these things. It's just another day at the office until you, get later in life and then you start talking to people about it and then it's like wow uh you know it's kind of a historic you know event that we got to be a part of uh you know it's the first successful pow rescue in over 40 years yeah yeah and then what happened in terms of recovering the bodies were you were you guys part of that uh, no, that was uh, 175 with, you know, their guys on the trucks so that they recovered them and then they uh, ground exfilled them out on their um, on the Humvees 
And uh, so we just, you know, maintained blocking positions and stuff until, you know, that they were done and, and they had exfilled the trucks. And then we pushed out for uh, exfil on the 46s and, you know, got back on the, on the air base there in Nazaria and, you know, high fives and handshakes and it was all good. And, um, you know, go find your friends in 175 and see how the, everything went on their aspect of it when they rolled back in. Yeah. And how, I mean, I can't imagine that, 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 uh, that was, well, of course it wasn't pleasant, but it th- was, it, was it pretty harrowing for them? Because those, those bodies were in sh- shallow graves, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, they, they said it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I could only imagine, you know, yeah. I, you know, later seeing some of the things that I've seen, you know, later on, it's just, you know, I, it's not fun. Yeah. Um, so uh, was there anything else that happened uh during that trip to iraq that was notable um, we did about? um op- you know uh, operation reindeer which was a oh, that's you right. know the the true you know the the true ranger mission smash everything kill everyone you know destroy it all and then you know come out high five and and, and handshaking at the end um uh we had our first um wounded in action on that on that deployment a team leader from uh second second squad uh got hit with an rpg and and lost his uh lower left leg uh so you know um uh you know other than that it was it was a you know it was a it was a great traditional you know typical um ranger training op you know do you you remember everything Oh, I'm sorry, but do you remember any many of the details of Operation Reindeer uh, in terms of like who you were after and sort of what, what how it was going to go down? Yeah, so what what it came came down to was that there was a a, a, a SIGINT collection that had you know large size force was kind of out training in the uh, in the desert kind of northwest uh, Afghanistan or uh, Iraq and um, it was just basically, you know, it was like 80 to 120 is what in, Intel was, was putting on, uh, that it was. And, you know, you could tell they were holding formations and they were doing training and, and things like that. And so it was, uh, you know, who could hit this first and, you know, at, this is at the big command level. And this is, you know, what's been filtered down through the company commander at the time was that, um, it was in the 101st AO or area of operation and um they were going to take like a week to plan it out and that what didn't make you know the powers that be happy and so it kind of came to the special ops side and you know we just said well we can hit it tomorrow and so we you know just worked through our normal op cycle and planned it out rehearsed it and you know it it basically other than um matt getting hurt you know it, it worked it, you know, the same way it does in training. Um, but even to that part, you know, we train, you know, casually play and all that stuff. So it, it just sucked that, you know, it would actually happen. Sure. Um, so, I mean, that was a pretty but, sizable force on that target. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, uh, the, I don't, the exact count. I don't remember exactly the number, but, you know, it was over 80, um, uh, so first and second came in on helos and and third had launched basically um uh, about 10 hours before the half the the helo package launched and and they drove up on trucks they were going to do the backside blocking and set up the fart for the little birds and and all the stuff and so then they you know after we exfilled the half then they stayed and uh, kind of did the bda the b- battle damage assessment afterwards and gave a rough count and you know, handed the objective over to the 101st when they, they came in to take control of it. And um, so it was kind of interesting when they came back, you know, was kind of get the picture of, you know, what it looked like in the daylight. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so after that, then it was back home. Uh, you would become a team leader. Or were you yep, already, moved yeah. over to Charlie Company and took took a fire team over to Charlie Company? 
Uh, and then uh, we did the the winter surge in 03 to Afghanistan. We walked around in the mountains for six weeks. We always call it Mount Phase Research for those of us <laughs> that were there. <laughs> and can you tell us about that? What uh, was uh, was it similar to your first deployment to Afghanistan, or was it completely different? I was different because we were up in the Konar and in the Pesh River Valley. This is that uh, big surge. And, and this is the big surge Wesley Morgan writes about, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. So we were, you know, kind of expanding the footprint and just kind of getting into the mountains to to, to kind of chase down some of the rat lines that people were, um, you know, Taliban fighters were using to to come in and just kind of deny the access through the mountains in the winter and and show that everybody that, hey, we're not afraid to come up here and we're not afraid to to hang out for weeks on end and 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 do our thing, which was it was fun. I mean, it you know, like I wrote in my books, you know, some a lot of the people, you know, at, at, in villages at like 10,000 feet, you know, they're still thinking that the Russians are in there. Yeah. And so, you know, just to, to see the disconnect in that country at, you know, at, at that, you know, at, at that primitive point was like, oh, uh, no, they haven't been here for like 10 winters now. At least. What was it like operating at that altitude and such? Like, I mean, that's some of the most difficult terrain in the world. Uh, it was definitely um, taxing, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the guys, you know, that never been at altitude like that. Some of the guys, you know, out of Florida and Georgia and, you know, never, you know, being on the uh, Mount Yona and Ranger School is probably some of the highest elevation that they've ever been on. And so you get guys up there, you know, at 10,000 feet or, above and guys are coming with altitude sickness and they're just not being able to adjust as easily as, as some. And, uh, you know, Manning is still low and Charlie company at the time, cause it's just coming off the Iraq thing. Guys are like, oh, I'm out of here. We got hosed over. And so we're, we're in there with five man squads. So we're still carrying all the gear for nine. And so, uh, you know, that, the only only nice thing is we went in with no body armor. We were just carrying chest racks and rucksacks, but the rucksacks were still weighing in about 80, 80 to 90 pounds, depending on, you know, what is in there. Yeah. Yeah, that land will break you, too. That's not easy terrain to move over. No. Um, you know, there we did... Uh, <clears throat> we did hire on some uh, pack mules, which is kind of interesting. Um for a while and that was a lot of it was just to go to the resupply points and be able to bring bring back the supplies that we needed instead of doing the ranger school ruck dump and then walking down and loading up and then carrying it all back up it's like well let's just hire some people with mules and we'll pack mule this stuff up there and you know all we have to do is just walk so did you guys just hire like the mules or did you actually have people because you have to know what you're doing with the mule right yeah, no, we we hired the locals okay. you know, at the time, and it's like, hey, you know, here's however much in you know Pakistani rupees that makes them happy and it feels like they're justified to waste a day, you know, renting their mules to us and walking them up the mountain. Yeah, and then bringing the cases of MREs and and whatnot. And uh, one of but, the story. Oh, I was gonna say one of the stories you told during that time. Uh, cause you, you guys were on the HVT, the high value target, the time sensitive target. And, uh, can you tell us about when you went out with the seal team? Oh, <laughs> so we had just coming out of the, out of the pesh. We'd been in there for three weeks and it was like supposed to have like a 72 hour rest and refit back at Bagram. So we all get back, you know, off the, off the birds and, you know, it's kind of standing around in line for showers and this HVT comes down and they said, Hey, the team's going to seal team's going to go out and, and hit this. And we've got to go out and do blocking position. So get it all back on and, and load up. And so, you know, I didn't get a shower. And uh, so we roll in there and we hit this, this draw off the, uh, off the Konar <clears throat> and uh, you know, seals are, hit the wrong side of the valley because Intel's just not very good in Afghanistan at this point. It's just, you know, it's humid. So it's, there's a huge margin of error in it. And uh, they didn't want to walk across the valley and, and go up. So they just called a helo to come pick them up from one side and carry them to the other. Cause they didn't want to walk it. Yeah. Um, in, in a nutshell, I guess that's the, the nice way to, to put it short. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so was there anything else on that? And for those of you who don't know, I, I'm not really drinking. I'm on meds. I had surgery. So <laughs> if I'm a little, like, <laughs> faded. <laughs> um, but uh, it was, was there anything else uh, on, that, on that particular trip that – because you mentioned that that was up to that point, like sort of one of the best sort of all around sort of, I guess, military experiences you had just in terms of, of the type of job you guys were doing. Yeah. You know, it was kind of the, um, for those of us later on that, you know, that were, that were still in, uh, in the regiment or the battalion, you know, that, that kind of became the baseline for the word suck. It was like everything else. If it didn't, you know, meet that threshold of just pain and misery. It, it wasn't that bad. Right. Uh, Cause that was, that was just brutal. I mean, you know, got knee, knees and ankles and, you know, guys are quitting and it's like, Oh, well, awesome. You can quit all you want. You ain't coming off the mountain. They're not sending a helicopter for you. Right. Yeah. Where are you going to go? Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah. you're a private, they're not going to send a helicopter to come get you. It's great. Awesome. We'll deal with, you know, you quitting later. <laughs> and, and those are also the type of operations that you hold over the new guy's head when they weren't on it. You're like, Oh, you know, they you start complaining there. like, ah, you weren't there. Yeah. But then you make yourself feel like a dinosaur later <laughs> right. on. Right. Right. Um, so then, so you guys are on this hopping schedule. Cause that was in 2000, like late 2003. And then, this spring, you're right back in Iraq again. Yeah, we did the the winter, the end of 03, we were back in Afghanistan, and then we were kind of doing the spring surge, as we refer to it, in 04, and it was just a short little 45 day to kind of reinforce the, the special ops footprint so we could move some um, units around, um, you know, shift guys and not lo have a loss in uh, combat abilities. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so, that was that was definitely interesting because that was like the the introduction, if you will, to IEDs. So, you know, at that point, you know, it was starting to get armored vehicles and it's like, why are we driving around with this? You know, what's the what's the big deal? You know, they're like pop can size explosives. And, you know, like within a year, you know, we're they're planting, you know, 2000 pounds of HME uh, under the roadbeds and, and blowing tanks apart. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, and not just that, but you talk about your story with the the tanks, the the Abrams tanks, right? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We had the, that that trip. We were going from Biap from the airport into into town into the green zone to to link up to do an op, and uh, you know we're running blacked out, and you know we got the city lights shining in our face, so you can't really see anything other than about. 20 yards in front of you, but you know, the highway is a long straight run. And so, you know, put it down and, and, and just go. And there was a tank that had been sitting in the median and they traversed the cannon to look at something with thermal off the cannon. And they brought the barrel across at a zero plane. And it was right at the same time we came in with the truck and um, almost killed the gunner out of my truck. Um, you know, he was in a, medically induced coma for about 45 days and his Holy face was shit. broken in about 13 places. Uh, turned the Mark 19 on the front of, on the lead truck into a, basically the receiver was a banana and the barrel broke in three places. The strike plate we never found. And, um, you know, it, it basically almost totaled the truck. It took us two days to get the turret, you know, reconfigured with stripped parts off other vehicles and put it back together. Jesus, that's insane. Yeah, it's 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 it, and it's weird sometimes too in combat how it's those you know in a war zone how how it's some of the most random events that that right you know you know blue on blue isn't always just friendly fire sometimes it's just these incredibly random yeah. events like that. Um, you know, and it, it was just one of those things they didn't see us because they were busy looking at something and we couldn't see them with the lights and just the you know the the uh we're all running you know the monocular pvs 14s and you know it's like well hey we're we're good we're on this we own this section of highway between town and and the airport and there's nothing going on out here ever and so you know we don't really need to you know right. watch out for for other forces but you know there's a tank sitting in the median and right right 
happened to be the, you know, I just had chosen to drive in the left lane as the lead truck, you know, and we, we hit it. it was, didn't damage the tank. I mean, we scratched the paint a little bit, but no damage to the barrel. Yeah. Um, and so that was a fairly uneventful trip for you guys, right? Uh, yeah, that one, that one was, yeah. Uh, as, as far as any, any operations that saw, you know, any contact in it, you know, there, there wasn't really a, a lot going on at that point. Uh, and then your next trip was Mosul. Uh, yes. Well, no, Afghanistan. Oh, Afghanistan. We went to Afghanistan. That's 005. That was uh, Marcus Luttrell. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. So can you... No, that's so, all right. Yeah. So can you tell us about that then? Uh, Marcus Luttrell, you know, was, uh, Afghanistan targeting was, you know, still in its infancy. Is still a lot of human base at that point in time in, in Afghanistan. So um, there really wasn't a great targeting platform to go on as, you know, we look for, you know, legacy targets and, and plan out some of that stuff. And um, as far as what the Rangers were doing, a lot of it, we were just on um, TSTs, time sensitive target manning for one platoon. And then the other was on uh, CSAR combat search and rescue as a you know, basic standard uh, Ranger taskings at, the, at that point in time. And um, we had just rotated off of the CSAR tasking onto the time sensitive target tasking. So we had just finished all the, the standups for, you know, running through timelines and, and checks on all that stuff and got the the word that, you know, uh, Mark Luttrell's team was, was going to go out and do this um, operation red wings. And, um, you know, as Rangers always do, you know, we get enough information to have a conversation about it at the chow hall table. And so we started talking with some of the recce guys and, you know, they're, you know, they're briefing us because they've been following this a lot closer than like a, a rifle platoon has. It wasn't kind of in our, uh, in our wheelhouse as far as targets we were looking at, but it's stuff that recce had been looking at in, in areas to do, to do some of their stuff. And they were like, yeah, we wouldn't do it this way. Not four guys. No, we'd take a whole recce section, you know, 12 guys. And then, but we wouldn't do it without a rifle platoon and support. You know, even if it was a, you know, 5k standoff between the two, because they can fight to us and we can fight to them. And it's a bigger footprint on the ground. Yeah. Do we run the risk of spoiling the target? Yes. But, you know, it, on the other side of it, you know, we, it, as Rangers, you know, we're always going to bring everything in the kitchen sink to bear on, on an objective to turn the, the, you know, the, the odds in our favor and, um, you know, did they do anything wrong the way they did it? No, they they made judgment calls along the way, and you know we can armchair quarterback this, right? You know, years years later and say, well, I wouldn't have done that, and I wouldn't have done this, but you know, they they did what they do, and right. So yeah. you know that led us into you know you know them losing comms and them getting in the fight, and you know as the as the movie portrays it out and. Um, you know, and then we got to go in and and do the combat search and rescue on the turbine three three crash site, and then figure out what the question mark is. Cool. What, what was team. what was going on in, on your base with your platoon? I mean, are you getting word that this team is compromised? There are guys who are MIA. We might have to go look for them. Then you find out a bird went down. I mean, can you take us through a little bit of that? So, so that morning, so June 28th, that morning, you know, we, we got up and we just did what Rangers do. You know, we got up to PT, went and ate breakfast going on with our training cycle. We were going to go out to East river range, uh, which is just outside of Bagram, the little town of Bagram. So we left the base, got outside there. We're, we're going to go do some shooting drills and, and just, you know, um, have a good session on the range. And we get out there and start throwing the, uh, target stands off the trucks and that's about the time that you know we we find out that the the bird's been shot down and um you know it was, it was hey don't for, don't worry about what you've thrown off the trucks get back on the trucks you know we got to get back and you know, there was a lot of guys who were like what are we doing and you know we didn't have any of the answers at the leadership level of what was going on we just knew that you know we had to be back for something that was gonna 
going to get briefed, you know, to us. And as the situation was developing and, and so then as we were rolling back in, you know, we find out that the, the aircraft has been shot down, that team's in a fight and, you know, we're just on standby at that point. And so I wouldn't really kind of understand the whole situation for, you know, probably another six years as I progress through, through leadership. But, you know, as I, as I tell people, it's, it, you know, it's it, as a young guy, you know, it's not that we're not going to get in there and we're not going to be a part of this and we're not going to, but we're going to turn the tables. So that way, when we do recommit forces into this area, we've got so many assets to bear on the objective that it, nobody would be in their right mind to want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it was probably, you know, about 10 hours or so, um, a- after the initial shoot down that, you know, that night as we're getting ready to, to launch and then you know, finally got the, the green light that we're going to go and we load up everybody that's going to fit on the aircraft at altitude and, and launch. And then we hit mountain weather, uh, on that night and have to divert infill and, and go sit at Jalabad for a day. And then wait to get infilled the next night. What what was your understanding at that time of the situation on the ground? Um, the so the understanding was that the forty seven had been shot down. There was no movement on that. You know, ISR feeds were terrible at the time. I, you know, don't know. I don't even understand how people could understand. You know what they're seeing on that screen. It was such a bad quality feed even then, you know, um, and so we knew that the aircraft had been shot down. We were going in to do combat search and rescue on the crash. Um, you know, um, Murphy's team was still a question mark as to what's going on. Cause there had been no radio comms with them since Murphy's sat phone call. Um, so the, the priority tasking was to recover the crash because we knew where it was. And then after that, it would just be to figure it out if you will um so we uh we we interviewed um tony brooks on the show before was he in your platoon uh tony was in one charlie so he was the other half of the okay. the element that went up so it was a uh, uh third platoon led the way because we weren't on the csar so we didn't have all the recovery and crash axes and all the stuff to to do that so we we kind of plowed the way, if you will. And we were there to kind of take the brunt of any contact that was going to be made because we were just there to add security to to what they were going to come in and do. And as far as recovery, that was, you know, uh, one Charlie's tasking at the time. So that was that was where Tony was. And. Um, OK, uh, cool. You know, th- yeah, no, it's cool to get like some different perspectives on it. So, so then, what was your platoon? You know, I mean, you just explained what your platoon's role was, but then walk us through uh, infill and getting on the ground. So, infill, we infilled somewhere about probably about eight thousand feet. You know, what we could get to with um, the package size that we had uh, on the aircraft, and so there, we knew there wasn't a way to land anywhere up there. So, we knew it was going to be a rope, and it was going to be at least at minimum a forty footer. And uh, it ended up 40. And then the, as the rope drifts, you know, it kind of goes 40 to 60 to, uh, oh you know, as as it works out. And then uh, when uh, one Charlie came in, I know their rope started at 60 <sighs> and it ended up somewhere around yeah. 80. T- and- T- Tony said they just roped down into fog with like no idea of where the bottom was. Yeah, yeah, it was. A, well, I mean, the fog came in after we were already on the ground. I know what he's talking about because... Um, you know, um, it is just the way the weather was working. And, um, you know, it's just, it was, it was, you know, one of those points where I, I never really, you know, after a private, I never roped with, with leather gloves, you know, fat, fast rope, you know, the working work gloves anymore. I always did it in I mean, Nomex shooting gloves. The hamburger like helper gloves. To, yeah. I never tried like trying to take those gloves off and always felt like my hands got so much hotter and, you know, I had a, uh, Team sergeant said, "Hey, just just rope in your shooting gloves because you don't have to grip the rope as tight. You dissipates the heat just as well." And he said, "Just try it on the fast rope tower." So I did, and that's a, that's a forty foot rope, and you know it wasn't terrible. And then I was watching guys carrying two forties and stuff roping in, and they've got the big thick gloves on, and they're squeezing extra tight just to have a feeling on the rope. Right. 
And so then they're burning in, you know, and their hands are getting so hot that, you know, they're blistering at, you know, still 10 or 15 feet above ground and they're just letting go. They're like, I'll just deal with it when I hit the ground. And, you know, when one Charlie came in, you know, they had the the same problem and guys were falling off and then they were just ending up in a big pile. And I know their RTO had had his uh, arm broken because he got stepped on. Yeah, that's. And so, you know, you got guys that need to get medevac, but. You ain't getting medevaced. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what was it like for your platoon roping in and, and getting on the ground? Uh, it, it wasn't, we didn't have any contact or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was quiet, you know, and then when you, when the, the brownout cleared and, and all the, you know, the wash of everything and, you know, you kind of look up the mountain, you know, you, you can see the crash because it's still on fire, still burning. And it, it's just kind of one of those, um, ominous moments, if you will, you just kind of, you know, the gravity of what you're doing has, has finally set in because you're seeing it with your own eyes and not on a TV screen. And then, it, you know, it just becomes the all night walk uphill through the nettles and, you know, the scotch burn or not the scotch burn, but, you know, the pines and, and all the ground cover that's up there in the mountains. And it's just, were you guys was there any intelligence that there were enemies on the objective or around the objective we had uh, you know um nais around the area but it wasn't anything like um uh, on on the objective we there wasn't any movement on on there you know throughout the day or or anything and there wasn't there wasn't any you know people coming and going from it um i think you know, looking back at it now as they realized what they had done and what was about to happen. And so they were just kind of got a little bit of standoff and they really were, it was to observe you yeah. know, how we were going to take care of it. Yeah. And so, you know, um, as the, the, that day turned into, you know, a week to two weeks, you know, there's at night, you know, you see little fires on the mountain and, you know, get eyes on it as best you can. And then AC one thirties dropping, you know, one Oh fives on it. Yeah. So what was that first movement that first night? What was the movement like for you guys? How long did it take? It took all night. It, it, we didn't get to the top until uh, about an hour before, um, you know, sunrise and then we're sitting there on it and then kind of listening to one Charlie, you know, s- suck their way up the mountain. And then uh, one Bravo was still about halfway up the mountain because they had driven in from Jalalabad the night or the morning that it happened. They drove up the 90K in their trucks and then they started walking from the base of the mountain up and they didn't make it until the next day. And, you know, only about half the guys that started to climb up the mountain made it up. The rest of them had to go back down and, and get picked up by the the trucks and and you know because they just either heat heat exhaustion or you know s- s- twisted ankles and whatnot yeah yeah and so what did that what was the next like week to what how what did that set in motion for you guys in particular so what it set in motion for us was um you know priority tasking was to accountability and recovery of all you know members of that aircraft crew and then the the qrf team that was on there so that totaled 16 and so we got those numbers you know kind of early afternoon and um there was a small clearing on top of the the mountain you could put a small helicopter like little bird on it but it was um you know cds drops for demolitions and uh you know basically had to create an hlz to be able to get everybody off that mountain that you know the remains for those guys. And so, um, it was kind of, a was a, a good distraction, if you will, to do timber charges and, and clear that space to, to be able to make enough room to bring, you know, a helicopter in. And, and so, um, we just finished our regimental breachers course. And, uh, so all that, old stuff, you know, that, that timber stuff was still fresh in everybody's mind. So it was, uh, you know, we're all sitting there trying to do the math and the first sergeants are like, use the P method. <laughs> yeah. And so we're, 
sending tree stumps and everything up, you know, like Roman candles. It was, you know, just pack as much explosives in these little burrow holes underneath and launch it. And yeah. uh, so that that was fun. We cleared that. And then we got to tasking for, um, you know, what would turn out to be go down the mountain and, and find Marcus. Um, and so that, that started the fun of the mountain weather moved in that night and dumped on us. And we're trying to walk downhill and, you know, the trails, a little stream bed at the time. And so guys are slipping and falling and guys are trying to not fall off the, the ridge. And then we end up, uh, just for safety reasons, you know, we end up spending the last few hours kind of huddled under pine trees waiting for the sun to come up so that we don't lose anybody. How many guys did you have left in your platoon at this point? Uh, we had split the four. So we had two, two squads in the PLs package. So, you know, the platoon leader, RTO, FO, were with us and then the platoon sergeant had his you know uh one squad two machine guns you know on on, still on the top and on the on the top of the mountain and um close to the crash site we we knew we were yeah they were still up there with with one charlie and and reinforcing them and we're just kind of the uh the maneuver element if you will um going down and trying to confirm or deny what this uh, push to talk signal was that that we were getting Mm -hmm. uh, being triangulated down into this. I, I always forget the name of the village, so I can't ever remember it. So you guys, you guys had to kind of like hide, hide out, not hide out, but you know, take cover under the pine trees until dawn and then continue to move down to where this, you know, ostensibly there is a SIGINT hit that you had to go investigate. Right. And so that was basically confirm or deny, um, you know, was it enemy recovered American equipment or was it actually, in fact, you know, uh, Murphy's team or, you know, what, what the question mark was still for that. And that was kind of where we were at for the tasking, you know, the, the crash had been accounted for. So now we're just trying to figure out, you know, the fate of, you know, this four man seal team. And so, um, you know, finally pushed down in there. Was it a consistent a, we, we, signal that you guys were going off of, or was uh, it just like a single, a couple hits and they're like, okay, around this general area? Um, no, it was, it wasn't like a consistent, but you know, it was like somebody just keying the, keying the push to talk, you know, intermittently enough to get a, you know, an orbital transmission to triangulate, uh, you know, where it was. And, um, so it was kind of confirm or deny what that was. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there was an SF team that was walking up that we tied in with okay. and uh, then pushed back down into this, this little uh, village. And then, um, you know, as we're doing the Ranger smash through all the doors and clearing the village, you know, here comes Marcus, you know, from up from where they had, had him hidden and kind of stashed. And so, um, you know, confirm that and then start, you know, doing the, so, so they actually uh, brought Marcus out to to meet you guys, right? They knew why we were there. They knew what right, we were right. looking for, and so it was to you know hand him over and then do the, you know, the kind of the whole SF thing where they do the you know let's drink some tea and talk and you know. Well, so what what was that moment like? As, what was that moment like when you first got face to face with Marcus and confirmed this guy's alive? And what what was your your perception of all that? Um. I don't know. The big question, you know, that we, you know, the first thing that we asked was once, you know, we went through the whole challenge and, and kind of confirmed that it is him, you know, through the whole, you know, MI, POW, MIA cards that, yeah, yeah. you know, we all fill out and going through that. It was, you know, dude, where's everybody else? You know, and then, uh, you know, he's like, they're dead. Well, okay, great. Not great, but, you know, it's like, okay, but where? They're on the mountain. That's it. You know, it's kind of that. Uh, you can't give me anything more. This, you know, it's just started kind of a, a frustration thing, and I get it. You know, he'd been. You know, that wasn't. That probably wouldn't have been fun to come down that mountain the way he says he came down that mountain. Um, but, you know, I. I would like to hope to think that you know if my friends were dead on that mountain. I could at least remember some kind of terrain feature that. I could at least tell somebody that they're, you know, they're up here in this area. And so what what was the next step after that initial, you had that initial questioning 
uh, of Marcus. Uh, what what happened next? So the, what happened next was, you know, we just kind of secured the little village that we were at and, uh, you know, confirmed that it was him, passed up, you know, over sap that, you know, we had him and we were in control of him. And then we just had to sit and wait for nightfall to come so that we could bring in the middle back bird and, and get him out. And then it just started, you know, um, days and days and days of sweeping and searching this mountainside. For the rest of the team. For the rest of the team. Uh, I mean, did you guys eventually find, find the, the remains of those uh, three other guys? Yeah, we expelled Marcus, and then the next day, you know, we were sweeping the lower portion of this of this um, spur, and uh, the other half of our platoon was coming from the top of the ridge down, and we were just kind of meeting in the middle. And so after we had met in the middle and, you know, kind of, traded information and they got a break um you know they started to climb back up for the night and we turned around and started coming back down to to finish our sweep they stumbled on on two of the remains just by happenstance somebody lost their footing and slipped into a little wash and and ended up you know face first with with two of them oh man that's rough and so <laughs> well the rough part was is they still had to go like 800 meters vertically with, you know, two, two sets of remains. And all we have is the old school, uh, poncho method to, to carry them up. Right. Uh, cause you couldn't do it with a litter. So it was wrapping them up in the poncho and, and kind of getting them up as best as possible. And, you know, then they had to carry it, traverse them across the ridge back over to the, the HLZ. And, um, you know, and then it, it it, that was the hard part is after that. Now we're just looking for one person. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, we ended up searching for, oh man, oh, well, probably another 10 days before we got ripped out when 375 came in. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, at that point, you know, we're, we're, we're 14 days, 12 or 12 days into this whole thing. And it's guys are just gassed. Yeah. And I remember Tony saying that, I mean, the weather, you guys weren't getting enough water that it, it was just, it, it was just nonstop for you guys. Yeah, it was, you know, from sun up to sundown, you know, and then you got to, you know, we're pulling security and small elements. And so you're not getting much sleep and guys are getting sick with, you know, dehydration stuff or guys are getting, you know, you know what happens when you, you get a bad MRE and then you got a little bit of food poisoning or whatever. And, and work doesn't stop. You just got to keep going. Yeah. Even though you've got a little bit of food poisoning from an MRE that may have spoiled and you ate it anyway. And yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so you guys get ripped out before you find the, uh, the final body. Yeah. And then, but it, well, we got ripped out. And then, uh, so I want to say it was probably eight hours later, you know, that 375 had, had found the, uh, the, the last one. And so, uh, you know, it was, we were happy that we were upset that, you know, we didn't end up finding him, you know, f- because somebody else had to come in, but, you know, we we're glad it was over with. Right. Right. Well, you said the, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, there were things that you pieced together years after uh, the event, because at the time, you know, you're a, you're a, a sergeant, you're, you know, reacting on the ground as things unfold in front of you, doing the best you can. I just want to ask you real quick, you know, what's your perception of what, ha- what happened out there today versus what it was when you were actually there as a, as a younger man? I mean, is there anything you've learned, anything that kind of like opened up your scope or offered a wider context that was surprising to you or that kind of that you look at this um, event much differently today than you did at the time? I think it just what, you know, it comes to mind is, you know, the, the amount of effort that goes into this type of situation is one of those things that we never trained for when, you know, nobody, ever goes into a training scenario that, Oh, we're going to have aircraft shot down. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. And then all this kind of stuff. And so it's like the worst of everything. Um, 
you know, as far as the circumstances and it's trying to understand all the pieces, you know, the wizard behind the curtain, if you will, of, of what's going on. And, you know, it's all the questions that we asked after we got back, you know, why did it take so long for us to launch? Uh, you know, what were the circumstances? And, you know, it's, it's um, when this type of situation happens, it, it is everything stops in, in, in theater, uh, you know, and then it's, it's all assets shift focus and it's trying to put everything in place so that way you know like i said you know when we do commit the force it is you know with all the odds it can be stacked in our favor as best as possible and so you know not not to jump forward too far but you know it was kind of one of those things that always stuck in my head and then when the extortion one seven shoot down happened you know, we're on the ground. And so then it's, I can explain, you know, cause I'm the old fart at this time, and, you know, it's kind of explain to the boys on the fly is like, Hey, look, you know, this is what's happening behind the scene. You know, we're here in the middle of it right now, but this, this is what's going on on the backside. And so it's not that, you know, we're not going to get things that we need, but there are steps and things that have to, that have to happen. And so it was one of those, that was the big learning lesson for me was you know, what are, what are all these steps on the backside of, of this type of um, scenario? It's, uh, as we, we talked about on, on last Friday's episode, I mean, it's, it's amazing the effort that the U S military will go through to recover our soldiers. Uh, even if it's only to recover their remains, that will go through incredible lengths to, uh, to, to repatriate every American troop um, is just incredible. Right. Right. You know, that was, you know, um, the um, Warfighter series on History Channel. We did a segment with with this Marcus Luttrell, uh, Red Wings Recovery. And, and, you know, it was something that he said, you know, it's, you know, when they get in trouble, you know, they it's, it's not expected. But, you know, when they say that the Rangers are coming in, you know, it's they're coming in with everything, you know, because you know, we're bringing everybody that we can and we're bringing all the toys and all the stuff and, you know, we're bringing a big footprint. And. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, I, I mean, and, you know, even though it was, it was challenging for all the Rangers involved, I mean, I, we, I mean, I'm grateful. And I think, you know, obviously the families are grateful. Like everybody's grateful that, that those seals did come home, you know, yeah. that they were found. Um, because that would also be a horrible, you know, thing for a family to go, uh, are they just out there missing? You know, are they still alive being held somewhere? Like To, to this day, I mean, DPAA, I mean, we deal with it with our Vietnam veterans. Yep. Uh, you know, there, there's like 150 Special Forces soldiers alone, I believe, who are missing somewhere in Laos in Cambodia. And I mean, that's just terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after, did it, uh, aside from that, you guys ripped out. So you left Afghanistan at that point, correct? Yeah, that was our last off. You know, we were out of there with just a, a couple of days long enough to, you know, download the ammunition, pack everything up, throw it in a pallet and get on aircraft. We were, we were out. And then you turned around and then you were in Mosul in 2006. And uh, it was I thought your yeah days. I thought that your uh the, your chapter name Fast and Less Furious was was funny. Can you can you tell <laughs> us why you why you called your chapter that? Uh, it was just a. I'm not really sure anymore. It was just kind of a a play on on words with you know, I you know things are speeding up in in Afghanistan, but you know or in Iraq, but you know not necessarily are we having more fun, if you will. There's not, you know, we're smashing targets and, and taking guys in, but we're not really getting in the fight. You know, right. There's no gunfights really right. going on. And part of that, uh, the way, uh, what I got from this chapter and the way you explain it, the reason you weren't getting in, a, in as many gunfights is because you guys had really nailed down how to do these hits and that 98% of these mm -hmm. hits were, were done silently where the bad guys never yeah. even knew you were there until 
Exactly. You know, it was one of these, you know, so we've just come out of Afghanistan. We've been dealing with this and, you know, the other battalions are, are, you know, kind of setting this new trend, if you will, this new TTP for this, what we're calling silent entry. And, you know, it's not the traditional ranger blow the front door open, go in, smash everything. It's, you know, how can we come in as sneaky and quiet as absolutely possible and, you know, basically we're waking people up out of a dead sleep to take these targets. And so, you know, it, at first you're like, oh, this is such a big letdown. But then as you start going on and it, it really becomes this thing that we're all kind of driving for is, you know, mission success is now not how much can we smash, but how, how successfully can we get in repeatedly, silently without, firing any of these shots because now we're getting all of this intel from all these people through interrogations and, and all this stuff. And so, you know, when you shift your mindset kind of away from the traditional, you know, what we like to call the Ranger smash, and now we're kind of playing on the same TTPs and, and kind of lines that, you know, team six guys are playing on and Delta force is playing in and they've been having success for, you know, years and, you know, all kinds of settings around the world that they're employed in, you know, we can, as a ranger resident, we can em employ these types of, you know, operational guidelines that we're going to go do this and we're going to do it as quietly. And mission success is now based on the amount of people that we can not kill on target, but we can drag off target. Right. Um, you know, and then it really becomes the, the driving force, you know, mission success is now can we do it and how many times can we do it? And then, you know, it's kind of the, not necessarily mission failure, but you know, if, if shots are have to be, you know, fired in, right. You know, what did we do wrong that, that got us into that gunfight because it's really impressive, you know, as, as a leader, when you can bring like 13 plus guys into a target building and roll up 14 or 15 dudes uh -huh. without anybody knowing that you're even in the room. Right. And so, you know, that was, you know, and, and then when we started going into to other techniques later on, you know, it was like, but we're so good at this. Why are we switching to doing this, <laughs> this other thing? And, and you know, uh, I, I never really liked what we call prefer, you know, later on, it would be the the call out. And right. I understand the, the, you know, as a leader, the, uh, the thought behind it is that it's less risk of force because we're now telling the enemy and you know for those of people who don't understand it it's kind of like what you know a SWAT team will do mm -hmm. or you know the FBI does you know when they surround a a house or a compound or whatever and then they're getting on loudspeakers and they're telling people to come out and surrender and and all that but you know it's never the fun way to do it. it's kind of you know if you will it's boring right Right. Can you walk us through like one of those ops that really like stands out in your mind where you, you know, you just kind of like pried open the front door and, and Rangers and night vision just kind of slipped through and. Um, well, there was a uh, muzzle. We, we had one op and I mean, we had been in probably four or five houses down the block trying to get the, the right house. And, and when we finally did get the right house, you know, we popped the front door open all nice and quiet. And I mean, there was no, there was no reverberation off the metal door or anything. We had, you know, pressure and counter pressure working and, you know, we ended up, you know, sliding in all nice and, and quiet. And then, you know, I had a whole squad of guys, you know, pulling security on dudes. And then it was, you know, we had the first floor, you know, secure as, as far as, you know, guys are, we got guns on the right amount of people and, and, you know, we've got a whole nother squad is sneaking in to take care of, you know, what needs to be going on upstairs and everybody's all super quiet. And, you know, we're basically, we take the whole house down all in one shot and we end up with like 16 detainees and, you know, the whole target's done in 45 minutes. we got everybody's tagged and bagged. We've done all the site exploitation and, and, you know, and then we're, we're on to the next objective. Yeah, that, that, and so that's amazing. When, when you know when it, when you can look back at that and and be like, wow, I was a part of that, and you know that that worked out great, and and you know when you can explain, you know that that is, you know, mission success because you know intel drives the targeting, and when you don't kill the intelligence, then you get more targets, and you get to go have more fun, and right, uh, you know. 
when you could explain that to the younger guys who are, you know, 19, 20 and just kind of chomping at the bit. And it's like, no, Hey, relax, relax. We're, we're being smooth. We're being quiet. Um, you know, this, we started, you know, climbing walls and, and, you know, then, then it became the whole, you know, can we do a top down, you know, can we come in from one building or can we ladder up the side of the building? And, and, you know, not only can we come in from the ground floor, but can we send an assault force in from the top floor and, and still do it all silent? You know, the, it just becomes a, a whole other side of, you know, this developing persona that we're creating in the Ranger Regiment. It's not just are we the ability to go smash things, but we can be as precision as anybody else, but do it with twice as many people. Right. I I want to take just one second here to give a, uh, a, a little... Uh, advertisement actually for our, our own podcast um we have a patreon site and there's a link down in the description if you guys check it out and if you join you will get ad free episodes uh you get all these episodes without any of the ads in them and uh there's also a couple bonus episodes and bonus segments um that you guys can check out so um the link's down in the description that's all i wanted to throw out there tonight oh you get deep thoughts by jack and dave sitting in our smoking pajamas and uh you know talking about the way of the world plus a, gr- a lot of great bonus content yes um but uh so then after Missoula, you guys did ramadi which is a lot more of the same but now you guys are operating on boats uh yeah that- we're on the on the swick boats on the sock ours no and, shit uh, yep yeah, so that you know it was a uh, it was different it was totally fun i mean um you know because at the time you got to remember ramadi and fluja are they're still on the you know, it's still a wild west out there. You know, the Marines are still having it out all day long, every day. And we're trying to, you know, kind of squeeze in the seams and, and do what we're doing. And, um, you know, we had a company commander at the time. He was notorious for, you know, any holiday. It was the day that, you know, he had been blown up. And so he didn't really like to drive anymore. And so he's like, the only holiday I've never been blown up on is Halloween. And so we took a, the ground assault force out in Strikers and uh, hit a target, driving back. And uh, his truck gets popped, and um, you know, it was a what we call a catastrophic vehicle kill. So it's a striker, but it had a hole penetration, and uh, it was enough to penetrate the bottom of the floor. And then what came through stuck in the back of the the seat on the driver, but nobody nobody was hurt. And you know, it's a testament to the striker as a vehicle platform that we were using. It blew all the circuit breakers in the vehicle, and all the driver had to do was just reach around, push the breakers in, and start back up. And it drove all the way back to the gate and then it gave up the ghost, you know, the whole, the steering linkage in the front broke apart and it was plugging the, uh, the ECP there at the, uh, at the gate onto Ramadi. And so that was kind of fun because we had to move the, the T barriers out of the way to open it up so we could get the wrecker in there to, uh, hook onto it. Cause there wasn't a way to, to pull it through the chicanes, um, with, with that with all those barricades in place so we had to you know it was probably a three-hour process to get that truck through the gate you know we got all the marine convoys and army convoys and Ramadi. they're all backed up sitting outside waiting for us to, to move our piece of junk and so uh after that you know the team six guys were like hey we've got you know the boats are down you know at the little off-site you know on the on the river and you know um we can start employing those. And so we started doing, you know, boats in helicopters out or helicopters in and boats out. And that's pretty cool. Know, kind of and riding the rivers. And uh, it was definitely really cool because we could get way closer to target uh, on the boats than um, you could with, you know, helicopters without the noise signature. And uh, it just, you know, opened up a whole nother avenue of, of a technique that we had really, you know, been utilizing. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, I, I just, I've only, never thing, been... only thing I wish that it was, it had been in the summertime instead of in the winter. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I've never been to Ramadi before. So I'm, I'm actually looking up on the map. So the Euphrates kind of runs right through the center of the city. And there's a few like outlets, one of, one of which it looks like it runs right into like the city center. Um, right. That's pretty, that's pretty cool, man. So you were, you said you were able to get closer to target using the boats. Yeah, we could get within, you know, a K of, of the target building or, you know, depending, sometimes it was within, you know, 
four or 500 meters of the target. And so, you know, you have the last, you know, the, the LCC is, you know, basically at the boat drop-off point on the beach and then, you know, move the target and take the target down and, you know, then move to Exville and, you know, just short helicopter ride back onto the base. And so it was, uh, you know, it was definitely fun because we were the, one of the first to actually implement it. And so, uh, you know, we kind of got to be on the, on the front side of that as far as what the Red Rangers were doing with, you know, boat, boat ops. Yeah. Um, now, did you guys, did you guys have those? I mean, I know that boat ops was always supposed to be a Ranger thing, but it really, we only, at least like in the nineties, yes. we only used it for training. Like, did you guys have those in theater? Did you acquire them? Did somebody else have them and you borrowed them? How, how did that all start? Well, it was the it, there were the Swick boats, so the teams brought them, and the so the the Swick teams were the guys they were manning all the boats, and so they're the Sockars, the the you know the nine hundred horsepower twin jet drive, uh, uh, you know forty foot uh, salt boats, uh -huh. and so you know they've got a whole there's a whole crew, this Navy guys that drive the boats, gun the yep. boats. All yep. we did was just get a ride, and um. That's pretty cool, so, man. Yeah, that, I, I never even knew the Rangers did that. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely fun. Um, you know, and the in the the boats of you know everybody's like, well, I wouldn't want to do that. Well, it's a fully armored boat. You know, it's nine hundred horsepower. It'll do fifty miles an hour on the water and Sa it's safer safer than driving. It's, it's safer than driving down a road that's packed full of IEDs. Yeah, unless they're like deploying limpet yeah. mines or something. Yeah, like mines. Yeah. Frog men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, there had been there was a time, you know, early on where the enemy had been trying to figure out how to IED the river and they couldn't figure out how to do it. And there wasn't any success with it. They had tried hanging them from the bridges. But, you know, you can see that. And then they tried to uh, plant them in the river banks, but it wasn't anything that was going to cause any kind of lethality to the boat. So they just basically gave it up as like, well, if they're going to use them, then there's nothing that we can do about it until they come on target. So uh, I I know that so we have like more Mosul and Afghanistan and I don't want to leave too much out but I also really want to get to I, I want to talk about um, 2011. Uh, okay. Um, I want to make sure we talk about that. Uh, am I missing anything? I'll speak. Uh, yeah. So can we talk about 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 your injury about how all that came about? Yeah. So. Do you want to skip the extortion stuff? Oh, no, no. Let's to... talk about the extortion. Yeah, yeah let's talk sure. about we'll extortion once first. I'm first. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no that's okay. I, we can... it's... So that, this was kind of the uh, the 2011 um, deployment. was the, It was the last of the, the surge, the special ops surge into, you know, Petraeus's surge into Afghanistan and, and kind of increasing that force. So uh, BICO was the last company and second range battalion to uh surge whether stay late or or go early and um <clears throat> so we had just finished the uh the capex at fort bragg which is the big you know the special ops dog and pony show for congressmen and uh you know the president and, and all that stuff it, it, which was fine because it gave us you know an extra week of training with you know 160th and and some you know platoon time if you will to run around and work through fine tune some ttps and some sops and uh, bring some of the new guys a little bit tighter online with you know how we were going to accomplish these these tasks when we get in overseas so um you know we got tasked to go to um uh, fob shank uh, and be tasked with uh team six uh under their command and so uh we went over and and did that and uh you know we had a pretty good working relationship with with uh gold squadron um for for that uh early part of that deployment and then uh the uh you know night of august 6th rolls around and so um objective lefty grove comes up on the table as a you know it's a a target that had been tracked and chased and kind of lost but never could get a lot of fidelity to to it because he's a pretty dynamic target meaning he's constantly on the move and and you know hard to nail down to to one location but he had rolled into the tangy valley on this you know this day and and sigint had kind of 
pinned him into a certain location inside the the valley and, and a little cluster of buildings and it was enough that it was probably about 70 percent fidelity on the on the objective targeting that it was it was still solid and um we had just come off a few days of weather and uh we're looking at maybe some more days of weather on, on the back end of this so it was we had this little like two day window of of good weather to, to do an op and i just kind of you know <clears throat> looked at the at my peel and you know we went to to chow and we were sitting there having the conversation. I'm like, look, I'm willing to take a swing at 70%, you know, for this target, you know, uh, you know, we're going to be stuck sitting for weather for a few days. And I, I don't, you know, we've already been stuck sitting and Ranger doesn't do well sitting, sitting around with, with weather if we don't have anything to do. So, you know, I was like, I'm willing to take a swing at 70, you know, we're going into the Tangy Valley. So it's basically a guaranteed gunfight. And, um, you know, what do you think? And he's like, yeah, I'm willing to take a swing on 70%. So we went back and pitched it that we'll take a swing at, at it. And if nothing else, you know, we'll let him know that we're chasing him and kind of break his pattern of life. And and usually when we can do that and break the pattern of life on people, that's when they start making mistakes and mm -hmm. it becomes easier to, um, you know, launch, launch a follow-on operation because he's not sure what he needs to do. And so, you know, we, uh, drew up the plan and uh, uh, got approval and, and then uh, briefed the plan, pitched the plan to the boys. And, you know, it was one of the only times I've ever told the boys, uh, well, that's actually it was the only time I ever told them, I was like, you know, this is the Tangy Valley and, and it's not an if we're going to get into a gunfight. It is a 100% we are walking into a gunfight on this night. And there's a reason why, we only go into this value on the, the no illumination cycle. And that's because they're going to shoot at anything, helicopters, aircraft, people. So, you know, switch it on, put it on straight and, you know, we're going to get it on tonight. And so we had an uneventful, you know, infill when no rounds taken because we had flown in a uh, extortion one, six and one seven had been our infill aircraft. And so then they, um, flew back, cycled through, and uh, Gold Squadron was on uh, QRF for for us or any follow-on objective that, that came up from what we were doing. And um, <clears throat> so infield, got the guys on, got the boys on the ground, uh, you know, started movement to the objective, got word that, you know, there was um, eight to ten enemy fighters moving off the objective. And so – we uh pulled formation got clearance for fires with the uh, apache gunships and and lit into them with the apache gunships uh two gun runs per aircraft and and then pushed the target uneventful after that and then cleared through the the contact and uh had stirred up a bunch of you know stuff in in the valley and so you know i was it's just you know guys in their rebel rousing um trying to get guys to come out and, you know, gather a force to come and fight. And so we're clearing through our target and, uh, you know, it's, it's looking good for what's being seen on ISR because they're seeing a bigger picture than what I've seen within, you know, a thousand meter circle of my objective. And so the, the call came from the, from the jock to uh, my platoon leader and myself was like, Hey, are you guys going to go, you know, you're going to go push farther into the Valley and, and, you know, taking on this contact and, and at the time, you know, we we're working a pretty good objective and we were actually kind of thought we had what we were looking for on the objective as far as who we went into the, to the Valley to get. And um, we said, no, no, we think we're, we're working it. And um, we have what we want. Um, they said, you know, do you care if, you know, Gold Squadron comes in and, you know, it starts their own movement to contact on, on the rest of this objective and, you know, about 5k to the West of you. And I said, well, that's, plenty of deconfliction of space for small arms fire. So if they want to come in, you know, and that's what they want to do, good on them, you know, it had been a, a pre-briefed uh, discussion between um, my platoon leader, myself, uh, Jonas and Lou, the, the master chief and the commander for the gold squadron that, Hey, look, if, if it does ever happen, that it's a single objective, but we end up bringing in the other element, you know, we'll link up and then we'll just kind of work Xville you know, as, as it plays out and if we have cycle aircraft and we'll cycle aircraft and, you know, 
um, we'll just get it done. And it's like, okay, great. Awesome. So we knew how that was going to go. We kind of had a pre pre-planned position where we were going to link up, you know, if that had happened and, um, you know, we got the word that they were loading on the extortion and, uh, we weren't sure which way they were going to come into the valley. And we kind of said, Hey, we recommend, you know, if you overfly our objective, then we can at least, you know, provide ground cover for anything. And, you know, <clears throat> but that we, you know, we only get a small amount of say, and it doesn't really carry that much weight as far as what the air planners are doing. Um, you know, cause these are conventional aircraft. So the pilots are only flying what's been approved through, through their S3 air shop and, and so, you know, what we were saying to our jock is not necessarily making it over to theirs. And so we were like, well, okay. So you get the call that their wheels up and they're 10 minutes out. And uh, so we wanted to clear one more building. So we kind of pushed to try and clear the building real quick and um, get the call that, you know, they're six minutes out and then uh, three minutes out. And so we held our, our assault and what we're doing and we're just kind of sitting there waiting and I'm waiting, I'm waiting to see the birds flush after infill. And, and so that we're not, you know, if we end up shooting on target that we're not going to end up ricocheting something into aircraft because they're within, you know, small arms distance. And then that, that never happened. And I was kind of wondering what's going on. And then we get over the fires net from the FOs that there's a, a fallen angel. And I had known what the, you know, the, the, pro word if you will is and i was just kind of dumbstruck by it and i said say that again and he's like we're a fallen angel and i was like okay now so that my brain and my you know it's all connecting you know speak it in english and uh he goes extortion has been shot down and i was like okay great so then it was you know how fast can we back out of this target building how fast can i get the guys on the road and get them to start moving even though we don't know exactly where it is yet, it's I just know the general direction that we need to go, which was to the west. And so we got the boys back out of the objective, off the objective, and we're moving in about three minutes, you know, as far as getting guys pushed out. And then it's trying to – all the weapons and everything that we had accumulated on our objective is trying to take all that stuff with us and, you know, get everybody and everything on the move and, and not leave – you know, all, all this stuff to potentially be shot in the back with it. So mm-hmm. send it forward and find a place to blow it in place. And, um, you know, then the question comes to like, what do we do with all these detainees? And so it just becomes, well, leave them. And, uh, you know, people are like, well, are you going to untie them? I was like, nope, somebody will come over and cut them loose later. <laughs> I'm not not cutting anybody loose. They can figure it out. Right. And so we got off the objective and started moving. I just, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, when the, the lead element and the snipers and the, the dog handler finally got within an eyesight of, you know, around the terrain feature. And it was just this, uh, you know, I won't use the profanity, but it was one of those, oh my God moments. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole night sky is just lit up with just fire and, you know, the, the, the burning wreck of it. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out, you know, the fastest way and, you know, should we, you know, the, so the Tangy Road that runs through this valley is heavily ied I mean, it's ied like every three to 400 meters. There's something planted in that road and it's to stop, you know, the trucks. And so there was this, you know, do we want to go over land? And I told the, the PLs like, hey, look, sir, my recommendation, we got to assume the risk to force and we're just going to have to stay on the road because we got to get there. Mm-hmm. And he said, I agree. So we just, you know, I told the dog and the handler up front, it's like, if it looks suspicious or he wants to, you know, to, to, you know, say that there's something in the road and just mark it and mark it good and just tell everybody to stay out of the way because we got to go. And so it took us about an hour to go the 5K to get up there. Um, and then you know it's a kind of trying to put this whole thing together on the fly and uh, you know everybody's radios are going nuts as far as you know the pl he's 
you know, like basically glued to the stat radio and just like, hey, sir, we got to, I need some information here. You know, we got to, you got to tell me how many people are on this aircraft, you know. So we're working through that and it's, you know, he, I finally get the numbers and I'm thinking, you know, it's half the force. And I'm like, okay, so, and they, you know, but he gave me the number 38. And I was like, so how many are on the other aircraft? You know, I'm not joking about it. I'm like, I'm in disbelief. It's like, how many people are on the other aircraft? And he goes, empty ship. And I was like, oh. And, and I was like, for those people that don't understand, you know, that aren't listening, that aren't, you know, in, in the military mindset of this is that, you know, it's a, it's a technique and it's not a bad technique. You know, it's a, it's a risk of force, risk to aircraft decision that leaders make. Do we put everybody on one aircraft and only risk one aircraft to enemy fire and get the force all in at once? Or do we only put half the element on one aircraft and the other half on the other? And the, the problem with that, you know, split force on multiple aircraft is, is that that lead aircraft makes contact that second aircraft is not getting on the ground. Right. And so then you only have half your force on the ground. So given the situation that they were going in to pick a fight with, you know, anywhere 12 plus fighters on that side, it made more sense to just risk one aircraft and put everybody on the ground all at once. And it's mm -hmm. not a bad decision. It's just, um, you know, people ask me, well, why didn't you do that then? Well, I brought 55 guys to the fight that night. And we don't fit on one aircraft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we finally get up there on, on the crash and, and we start, you know, saying, calling for supplies that we're going to need. And, you know, the, the backside support, you know, from, you know, guys in the rigger shop to doing CDS drops because we're out of we're out of water by this point. You know, there are supplies that we just don't have. And the whole way up there, I'm in my mind. I, I'm I'm flashing back to all the stuff that we brought in the night we did the you know the turbine three three and the Marcus Latrell. You know that six years ago, all that's flooding back into my mind, and and I'm trying to think of all the stuff that we had and all the stuff that one Charlie had, and I'm trying to you know request this stuff because at this point in the game, as far as you know the GWAT, this is combat search and rescue is not something that we have time to train on anymore. And it was something that, you know, back in the day when we assumed Ranger Ready Force One, it was one of those one day, two day taskings that, you know, we all trained, you know, right. it was like crash axes and smashing through. And this is what we do. Now we get fam egress once a year when we do rotor wing violets on, um, you know, if the aircraft has a hard landing, not destroyed, but it has a hard landing, you know, this is how we destroy the radios. This is how you destroy you know, the airframe, if need be, you know, and so on and so on. But at this point, it's like, okay, well, I need, I need body bags. I need water. I need biohazard, you know, and I, if you could find them, I need class D fire extinguishers. And so I'm trying to get all this information requested to the jock so that they can build this weird CDS palette to, to hopefully help us, you know, get everybody recovered because by the time we got on the crash site you know it was still a, a fireball it was still on fire for hours after and you know um it was one of those learning points i guess if you will for the for the job that hey look you know this is the second time in less than 10 years that we've had this happen and we don't have any class d fire extinguishers to put out a metal fire right and it'll helicopters have a lot of magnesium in them right and so um you know we did correct that you know later on that that all this stuff did did make it into country and thankfully that never had to be used it again but it was one of those where we probably should have some of this stuff at least on standby and um given uh, uh... given that you were already in a non-permissive environment i imagine in that you probably had a decent air package to start with, but what happened at that point? I mean, did they start pushing all the assets you guys needed? Um, yeah. So uh, air package, you know, we had a Apache's on station and then we had an AC 130 and then we had fast movers in the stack uh, at altitude. And um, so what happens is when this kind of situation happens is everything in the country shuts down. doesn't matter where at in the country it is. 
all operations are cease and desist. If you're not on target, you better be calling for X or you're walking home. Um, because you know, every ISR platform, manned and unmanned, you know, fast movers, rotor wing assets, they're all coming to wherever that crash is at. Mm-hmm. And it was nuts the amount of support that we had. Um, you know, and the so the big army's combat search and rescue element, the pathfinders, um, in the book, they're not you know, Pathfinder, Pathfinders, that was just their call sign was Pathfinder. Um, You know, those guys almost didn't make it in um, because they were shutting everything down. And so it was either going to already be there, which was us, or it was going to have to come in on a truck. Um, So they made it in just moments, moments before everything got shut down as far as rotary wing assets. And, and it, the, the, the strange part is, is that, you know, uh, transport aircraft have flying pairs or triplets. And so uh, extortion one six, the, the other aircraft in the flight, um, I had to get special permission to fly back from the objective area as a single ship. Now, I, I must have misunderstood because I thought when you were saying everything in the country got shot, shut down i thought you meant because it was all pushed to you guys but why would they shut down the the pathfinder or the the combat search and rescue effort it's a the rotary wing aircraft are are getting shut down it's not the fixed wing aircraft or the isr platforms or or any of that stuff it is the uh you know uh the apaches are are getting grounded uh all all rotary wing air assets are, are getting shut down at this point you know, and it's it's a timing issue of can we get these in and and basically what it is is it is it's allocation of assets and we just had a helicopter shot down so we're not going to commit any more helicopters into this area and so what their whole thing was is that they had to get on the ground after we had containment of the area to provide a ground force security element on their HLZ for them to be able to come in. And so we had that just, you know, right before the sun came up. So it almost, I mean, it almost sounds like they get super risk adverse. Like we have one helicopter it is. It down. It is very risk adverse. Yes. We have, a, we have a helicopter adverse. down. And so we're not going to risk another heli- helicopter to right. get you guys the assets you need because we don't want to lose another helicopter. Right. And that, so then a lot of it becomes like wow. things that we were requesting that normally would come in like on the back of a 47 and just get kicked out in a kit bag. Yeah. Uh, it has to get put on a fixed wing aircraft. So a C-130 and then it has to get CDS drop combat delivery system it has to get dumped to us that wow. way so they can fly in, you know, A-10s as air support and, and all that other kind of stuff. Wow. And, and it just becomes a risk aversion to more ground fire. Uh, so red wing assets. So how how did this unfold as uh, as the sun came up and you're continuing with this recovery uh, mission now? That's what this has turned into. Right. It's, you know, um, so it, it, it was all this is going on and, um, uh, you know, we're trying to, to figure out, what, you know, it, is there going to be anybody else that's coming in? And, you know, so we're we're securing the crash site in a, you know, kind of a football shaped uh, perimeter as loose as we can and uh to start working the recovery efforts of it you know it's still dark and night vision's not working because it's so bright with all the fire it, it just becomes this um I basically sent two fire teams out one on the north side of the 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 creek that uh the tangy river and one on the south side we just started doing concentric arcs you know basically fire teams online just kind of combing around this and what we're looking for is uh anybody that has been possibly ejected from the crash you know whether they had survived or uh you know hurt or whatnot and um so that was the first thing is you know how we how how much of this can we clear within reason you know get out you know 100 200 meters and make sure that you know when we start pulling remains we're not missing somebody because they got pitched out of the back um so that's how we found like the first um six to eight guys were kind of in this arc pattern that had been kind of thrown out within you know 50 meters um and then you know we got started getting the accountability and so then we started finding chunks of the aircraft 
uh, the rotor assemblies, the front and rear rotor assemblies, you know, are, are in these positions. And we're kind of assuming that that's the farthest that any of this wreckage is going to get as, you know, people aren't going to get that far, but, you know, the rotor blades are still spinning and, and torqued out and they're going to, you know, wobble off and, you know, end up in an orchard here or get slammed into a tree, you know, a cluster of trees over here. And, um, <clears throat> So then it becomes, you know, how can we work this problem while it's still on fire? Mm. And so then it becomes, you know, how long can we sustain, you know, the exposure to the heat and things cooking off and exploding and, you know, the risk of force for us to make this as fast as possible. And, you know, it, it um, it's just kind of one of those the real moments, if you will, because you start, you know, as the sun's coming up, you're starting to see the look on everybody's face of just, you know, horror and disbelief that, you know, I can't believe this is, has happened. And, um, you know, you, you try not to expose everybody to that. So you're really relying heavy on the guys that have a little bit more season under their belts and the squads that are a little bit more mature and, you know, so I was really relying real heavy on second squad at the time to, you know, to work this. And then as they started to get gassed and, and just worn out, uh, you know, rotating one other squad in to take over until we kind of got this all, you know, accounted for. Right. Um, and I mean, uh, I don't, but, I don't, I don't want to get like too graphic, but I, I mean, they're they're actually having to recover the remains of of these seals and and attachments, um, yeah, who burned up in the crash. And so we're a, we're picking them up out of the firing, you know, wreck and and stuff. So, um, it's a pretty difficult you know, job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if you were for the guys that were there, you know, it's we we had talked about it later. It's like you know, Hollywood couldn't have written anything more graphic right for people that you know want to imagine what this is like i mean you couldn't have written a script like this any right any more graphic than what it actually turned out to be as far as the way you know, movies are made now it's it's crazy right and you know um <clears throat> and I, I give the credit to the boys because they you know they handled a lot yeah that night and you know for some of them you know, it's their first deployment and, you know, they're seeing the worst that can happen. And so, you know, it's trying, trying to make sure that everything was okay. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, we, had, I think it was probably about four, four and a half, five hours. And we had everybody, you know, pulled out and accounted for and, um, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of some people left. Um, so, cause that was one of the questions, you know, later when talking with the jock and, and things after it was all said and done, you know, there was, you know, questions, questions over, you know, how did you get accountability? Because, you know, through the investigation, I mean, there was investigations that went on, this thing went on for weeks of, you know, there's, everybody wants all these answers. And so then, you know, one of the questions comes is like, how did you, you know, come up with that? You had accountability of all of these people, you know, and it wasn't prefaced. The the statement wasn't prefaced correctly because they're getting information from like mortuary affairs that says, you know, you can't count it as a human unless you have 51% of the remains. Jeez. And some of these guys are, you know, not to be graphic, there's you know, it's C spines and skulls. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you did the so, best that was you did the best you possibly could under right. combat conditions. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, we go uh, uh you know, we go up for the ramp ceremony. And so anybody who's spent any time in the Ranger Regiment, you know, personnel and accountability of people and equipment, that is the senior NCO's bread and butter. That's his baby. And so I just remember going into the jock and, and, you know, we're up there for the ramp ceremony. I'm kind of talking with the, you know, the regimental staff and the officers and, you know, bumped into somebody that I, you know, knew and I respected. And he goes, 
you know, hey, you, you did really good under the circumstances. And I said, sir, I got a bone to pick and I don't care if it gets me fired. You know, it was one of those. I, I, well, since when in the Ranger Regiment is personnel accountability of men, weapons and equipment, not the NCO's job. And when you grill my platoon leader over something that he's not involved in, mm -hmm. I have a big problem with that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm being polite about it. <laughs> You know, uh, but uh, it was uh, one of those those things where, you know, it's like, you know, we, we did the best we could under the circumstances. And, you know, I wouldn't have given you a false report in these circumstances if I wasn't sure that we had everybody. Right. And so your so, PL, you know, was, I, your PL was taking who, heat like they were trying like your PL was taking. Yeah, heat. there was a there was a, a, v, a VTC. So a video teleconference like a few days later and he was being grilled over you know accountability and how did we get these numbers but they never prefaced where they're getting their questionable you know right numbers from or or how we could say we had accountability and and so uh you know that came to to light and i just i i you know i was still short fused from the whole thing and i just was like well i don't care no, I I, I I get it. You're you're the platoon sergeant, and the buck stops with you. And you you you've said that, <laughs> you know. I and, under, and, I understand. Well, no, I mean, what was fun is that you know I I excused myself from the big jock, and you know we went over to the ramp to stand by for the ceremony, and somebody came over and they actually apologized to my platoon leader for you know that grilling, if you will, and I was. I actually thought that, you know, the, the fabled black Chinook was going to come in and, and carry him off and I was going to be without a platoon leader, but uh, <laughs> it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, it was, I, I felt, you know, justified after that, that, you know, he got raked over the coals for something that wasn't in his lane. Right. And, you know, I got him an apology. And so then everything was straight. Um, not, not trying to, to brag on the situation, but, you know, it was, well, not his and, yeah you guys and, speak and up also sometimes. that they are using an administrative standard for yeah yeah, yeah. you know it, yes you know this right this is this is a sailor but it's not enough of a sailor to be counted yeah get the fuck out like of here. yeah exactly yeah, yeah uh, and, you know like i said you know we the, <clears throat> you can't nobody can have more than one skull and one c-spine yeah yeah no i uh Max. I did, did the, did the army or the, did the military take steps to make sure that, that your guys were okay after that? Because that, especially if you think about some 18, 19 year old kid on his first deployment. So we, uh, sorry, that's okay. <laughs> we had, you know, throughout the rest of the deployment, we had, you know, the, the psychologists and the chaplains, you know, they were always coming in and checking on the guys. And, you know, as leaders, you know, we were constantly asking if they were, you know, doing okay. And, you know, if everybody was still having issues from before, but the, uh, the hardest challenge as a leader was to, you know, look, look the boys in the face when it was all done and everything got cleared to, to operate again was to, you know, tell them, Hey, we're going out. Mm -hmm. And we're going to load back on these aircraft and we're just going to keep doing business. And, you know, to see the look in some of their faces, it's just, you know, there's timidness in their eyes that mm -hmm. you can see is because they've seen the worst mm -hmm. that could happen. And, you know, to ask them to step back on those airframes and to, you know, assume that risk, you know, that was the hardest, you know, and then, it, it 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 got easier for them, you know, as we kind of settled back in. But you know, then we started, um, and we went back into Tangy like six weeks later, and we lost one of our guys. Uh, Tyler Holtz was killed. Um, had one other guy, uh, a specialist, who was wounded, and you know, all in the same area of, you know, where that crash had happened within about four hundred meters. 500 meters of the cr crash site itself because what we had done was we had gone back through all the video wow. and the ISR and, you know, figured out where that, those rocks were fired from. And so that became a target in itself, a, a very deliberate target. And, you know, we'd brought the rest of Bravo company up and did a big company op in there. And, you know, we put 150 Rangers on the ground and, 
you know, we were just basically what it was was to just say, hey, look, you may have shot an aircraft down, but we're not afraid to come in here. And, you know, then, you know, unfortunately, we have a team leader that's killed, another guy that's, you know, severely wounded. And, you know, so it is kind of this big, big downer for that. And, uh, <clears throat> And then, um, you know, and then I get hurt a few weeks later. And so it's just kind of weird. Just you know, one brawler just continues to just take a beating yeah. either physically or emotionally or mentally. And, um, it was a, it was a rough trip. I always, you know, guys always ask, you know, what was that one like? And I was like, well, at that point in time, you know, one Bravo had been in more gunfights at deployment than the rest of the battalion together, all the other platoons we had been in more gunfights on that trip and guys were just spent. Yeah. Nicholas, before we get into the operation that led to your injury, I, I wanted to ask you, because it's something we've talked about on the show before. And as a senior in CO, you know, you mentioned the one side of how the guys responded to the extortion one seven, the, the, the tim, uh, timidity or the timidness, uh, how is it? How as an NCO, did you have to deal with the other side of that too, of reining in the guys that wanted to get some, that wanted payback, and and would look, and and that was a broad definition of a payback. Sure, I know what you're. I know what you're getting at, and you know it's it's to say, hey, look, you know we're going back in here, but we're still going to be as professional as we possibly can and there will be no shenanigans you know it is to and beat that into them is like no matter what you feel no matter what happened with those guys we're not going to get shut down operationally because somebody wants to do something stupid as payback we're going to get it and we're going to give it to them in the right way and we're going to do it our way you know within the rules of engagement and you know and, and that's going to be it. There's, there's not going to be any shenanigans. Were there during your time in the Rangers, were there like leadership challenges uh, and if in that, in that sense, and if so, how were they dealt with? Um, not really. Um, I, I know what you're getting at. And, and you know, as, if, as a, the Ranger regiment or even just the battalion as a whole, you know, the, Kind of when you look back at, at the way things were when when everything started in 2001, you know, we started kind of as a special operations support, you know, we're there to, you know, provide security and blocking positions and, and things for, you know, Delta Force and Team 6 and, you know, to uh, get to the point where we're now we're running and gunning on the same target decks and, you know, the same targeting lines and, and you know, we've earned our right to to be in this point I, I most of the guys at this point as far as squad leaders and and you know even some of the senior team leaders but you know platoon starters we we know what it's like to be the guy on the outside looking in and now we're on the inside right there there was no way that anybody was going to risk you know ruining that reputation that that we had of for right. anything and right. so no, that's it's it's really interesting, um, because it sounds it sounds like it really was a a, a matter of responsible leadership, mm -hmm. in the sense of yeah, you know, setting the tone and making sure right. that that making certain that that tone is stuck to. Right, and, you know, and you know, a lot of that, you know, it comes down to the to the the people that you know we pick as NCOs to continue to lead inside the regiment. It's not, you know, it's not just me, you know, it, it's all the other 11 platoon sergeants that were there at the time. And, you know, it's all the squad leaders that we say, Hey, this guy has what it takes to be that squad leader. It's that guy that has the personal integrity to, you know, continue to push, push the, you know, what we're doing in the right direction. It's not to compromise, um, our integrity or or any of that stuff because you know um when those kind of things start happening and you start getting questionable uh circumstances 
chances on target, you know, then then your freedom of maneuver and freedom of movement and, and you know, what you do, it starts getting, you know, put under the microscope. And so nobody wants to be under the microscope. And so, um, you know, I give it to the guys that, that took over after I got hurt and, um, you know, the guys that are even still doing it today, you know, it's, it is carrying on that legacy of what we started 20 years ago and, and still continuing to develop, um, you know, where it's going in the future. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's awesome to be, you know, a part of that history, you know, cause I, I look at what the Ranger regiment is now and, back to what it was when, when you were there and, you know, when I was a young private and, you know, it is hands down a completely different organization and, you know, we can do all that old stuff, mm-hmm. but we are so much better at fitting into the operational roles that we have now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll just talk about the incident where you were wounded and then we'll take some viewer questions and yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So can you tell us about, yeah, the operation, yeah, which um, presumably a Purple Heart is in the works here. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's October 6, 7, um, 2011. You know, we're taking a swing at an IED and weapons facilitator. It's a mid-level target, you know, kind of the middle of the deck. It gets you the guys above and the guys below, which the guys below are, you know, the, the targets in the pyramid that, you know, the BS battle space owners are dealing with. And, and so when you slice out the middle, you can work the targeting from both sides. You can get the guys who are providing stuff from across the border. And then it gives you the ability to pass on to the battle space owner who's putting this stuff in the roads and trying to blow their trucks up. So, you know, that's kind of where we're swinging across the, the food pyramid, if yeah. you will, is right in the middle. And so, uh, well, we're in uh, Baraki Barak, or uh, well, Baraki Barak was the the little the the town, but we're in um, Logar Province, kind of on the east side of the the Tangy Valley, uh, and the the target. Uh, grids dropped in a little cluster of four buildings that all shared walls, so it's like a plus symbol. And, uh, you know, you get 25% chance of taking the swing right the first time. And so we swung wrong. And so we were reset all the pieces to, to move and, um, strike the next compound. And, uh, as we're resetting all the pieces, you know, I, uh, made a stupid decision that I'd preached a thousand times before and shoot houses. Don't ever put your body in front of an open doorway. And I had just instinctually i just stupidly put my leg across this doorway and as soon as i did it to hold the door open i took a three round burst uh took first round through the right thigh then i took one as i was getting spun out of the way i took one through the right armpit and uh entered in my armpit and exited out my bicep and then i took the last one uh through the through my helmet through through the helmet well, I mean, it, it split the helmet like uh, the Kevlar oh uh, opened up. So it, it hit right temple right here. And then it, it blew my nods off my mount. Holy shit. It came out right right on the top. I, I'm looking at the uh, picture in your book. I mean, that's that's bad. From your leg. Yeah, You're, that's bad. Yeah. So, and, you know, dual tube, dual tube night vision, you know, when I when I got everything, when I hooked it back on and and went to flip it down everything was offset and uh so i was people go well, what'd that feel like i was like well i know what a baseball feels like when somebody hits a home run yeah i mean and honestly uh, all those i mean all three of those areas your leg you know with the femoral and everything down there and then right and then your armpit like around going to the armpit is, is one of the worst things yeah is one of the worst things uh, right. So, um, when I finally, you know, after it was all said and done and I got, you know, I finally made it to Germany and I was talking, you know, had a chance to kind of talk with one of the surgeons who happened to be, um, one of the old battalion surgeons. Uh, and, you know, he came in and he was kind of joking with me. I heard about this cranky old ranger NCO who's down here. Just, you know, he's just giving me a hard time. And so, uh, I was like, 
you know, I was asking him questions. And I said, I know I got shot through here, but you know, what were the, uh, you know, how, how, how lucky am I or how yeah, bad right. was it? And he goes, well, you, you have the, the, you know, the femoral artery and the femoral nerve, they, they run parallel to each other down the inside of your thigh. And he said that round went right between both of them. God. Oh, and I was like, well, okay. And all, uh, all those ops. And this was the one that got you. Yeah. All that. And, and this was the, my stupid mistake. And, uh, so, um, you know, that being said, the, that night, that gunfight went on for, uh, you know, they brought in the QRF, two, two Bravo came in to back up uh, first platoon because we had, uh, I was wounded, uh, urgent surgical, uh, specialist Saros was um, expectant, and uh, then we had an Afghan partner who was expectant. He had taken um, a round to the face, and, uh, you know, we had... Uh, two other guys that were wounded severely, but they didn't say anything about it because they were still able to conduct ops. Um, uh, and then we had uh, 12 other guys that had received fragmentation because I got shot and then, you know, there was an exchange of gunfire and then the enemy threw a hand grenade out in this little alley. And so then it went off and, you know, I got a whole bunch of fragmentation in the back of my, you know, hamstrings from it. And then a bunch of other guys caught frag off it, but that, that, uh, objective alone that night we gave out 14 purple hearts wow wow so even after you got shot you kept getting him like they just wouldn't leave you alone you kept on you were <laughs> my frying you're like i'm out well, it's like I'm i got out. shot and then you yeah know, I, you know it's like time out no yeah uh, right right i'm already uh, out guys know, everybody goes everybody goes you know did you have this uh you know surreal moment where it's like time slowed down well, yeah because what i perceive in my mind as being you know just a minute or two is turned out you know it's probably about six or seven minutes yeah because you know my bell's rung you yeah know, the, the lights got real dim in the tunnel yeah if you will and uh i'm in my mind you know we do all this casually play during training but when it actually happens you gotta it's a conscious thought effort to go okay I have to put a tourniquet on. Yeah. And you're like, I know where they are, but uh, can I reach it? Yeah. Uh, uh, can I get to it? Cause I'm kind of laid over on it. And it's like, well, I can't really move. And I knew my femur hadn't been broken. Cause I stupidly stepped, you know, I put pressure down on my leg when I lost my balance after I got shot in the head. Um, so I was like, okay, good. You know, in my mind, I'm like, my femur's not broken. And, uh, so then I'm like, okay, I've got a tourniquet in my med pouch. And then I also have one down on my left calf, but I've got all this crap and I'm kind of in this weird position. Can I even reach it? Yeah. You know, cause I've got a, I've got a team leader and two other guys who are straddling over top of me trying to get guns through this doorway. And they're, you know, in the, in the fight and I'm not in the fight anymore. And right. I'm trying to like reach between their legs, and my legs and grab this tourniquet and put it on. And then, you know, that is sucks. And then you're like, okay, but I still have to crank this thing down and, you know, get it as tight as I can get it. And then there's a lull. And then, you know, I know that Saros is, is hurt. Um, you know, so I know I can get, I can probably walk. And so, um, you know, I get help stood up and then um, I try to get myself out of the way, you know, as best I can. And so I start walking uh, back down the alleyway to where we're going to have the CCP. And then, uh, you know, then, then my leg starts going numb and it's like, Hey doc, come here. You got to help me. And, uh, you know, I, really what I'm trying to do is just get out of the way, uh, so that they, the other medic can get in there and, and help Saros and, and get him kind of drug out of the way into the CCP. But, um, I didn't really start panicking, uh, about the whole thing until I, I got my equipment cut off and uh, my radios came out. And so then I I lose all situational awareness to the fight. Right. And then it's like anxiety comes in. It's like, I have no idea what's going on anymore. And I am not in control of anything, right. and, you know, as a leader. And that, that just sucks. Right. Um, but I knew when we reorganized uh, the priority for, for medevac and it became uh, myself and one of the snipers who took frag through the nose, took, took frag through the bridge of his nose. Um, uh, 
I knew that when I and him went from being on the second aircraft out to being on the first aircraft out and the Afghan and Saros ended up on the second aircraft, I, I just knew that, you know, things yeah. were not not going well. And, you know, Doc wasn't going to tell me anything anymore because I'm not in, you know, the first sergeant's on the objective. So he's kind of taken over those duties. And I just, you know, was bad at that point in my mind. It's just, you know, everything that's gone sideways can go sideways and inside out. And and so they medevaced you, and then when did you when did you become aware of how the operation went? Um, so I got medevaced and got back to Shank. Um, it was probably about thirty minutes after I'd gotten shot. Uh, by the time we got you know from the CC you know point of impact to the CCP, and then over to the HLZ to medevac, and then loaded it on, and then into the cache. And then uh, surgery, and then I didn't find out that Saros was killed until I got to Bagram. And then, um, you know, some of the guys that were in the S4 shop come over to, to tell me what was going on on the objective, and that hey, the QRF came in, and the boys are still out there. And, it, you know, the whole thing went for like six more hours before, you know, the sun, you know, it was – done and over with and they were pulling both platoons out just as the sun was coming up yeah and so then you bol- you begin that long process of rehabilitation uh yeah yeah <laughs> uh, uh so you know it was uh probably three or four days in afghanistan and bagram waiting on the medevac transport to go to germany and then it was a week in germany and then back to madigan and you know another week to 10 days at Madigan. And, you know, by the time it was all said and done, it was uh, a dozen surgeries and then, uh, you know, rehab. So I I didn't make it back on active duty status until after New Year's 2012. Did, did, uh, did you, were you able to contact your wife from theater or when did she find out about it? Uh, I, I called her right after I got out of the first surgery in, in Shank and, um, but they handed me the sat phone and I'm still, you know, trying to come out of sedation from that. And so, you know, sat phones don't work well when the antenna is pointed to the ground. And so I was kind of <laughs> frustrated, you know, my mouth's all cotton balled from, you know, the anesthesia and the fentanyl and, you know, uh, I'm frustrated that I cannot be coherent enough. I just remember handing the phone up to the uh, platoon sergeant, third platoon. I'm like, just please tell her. And yeah. so uh, he gave her the, you know, the, you know, the information that was going on. And then, uh, you know, the battalion commander called her a little bit later uh, while I was in surgery and in, in uh, Bagram. And so uh, she she knew within, you know, a couple of hours. Yeah. Yeah. You, you write in the in your book that you know, probably the most difficult conversation you had to have was with uh, the family of Specialist Saros and, you know, how he, yeah. he passed and, away. You know, that, that was, uh, you know, it was, it's always tough, you know, when you have to look, you know, them in the, you know, in the face and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that your son died and he died, you know, right next to me from, you know, not not getting shot. But, you know, he died from fragmentation that just happened to catch him under the arm in just the right spot where there was a gap in the armor. And, you know, that I survived and your son's dead. And, you know, that's that's one of those those tough situations. And, you know, because they can go one of two ways. You know, they can be they can hate you for life or they can embrace you. And, um, you know, luckily enough, his dad had spent uh, time in the army. Uh, so he understood. And so um, that was okay. And, you know, that was kind of one of the harder things, you know, uh, last year I got a chance to, to meet a bunch of the gold star families for the seal team that was killed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm always proud to, to meet them, but it's kind of one of those double-edged things is that, you know, they're still holding on to anger or grief and, you know, uh, which way is it going to go? You know, are they going to embrace you? Are they going to hate you? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's tough because I I never not want to meet them, mm-hmm. but you know on the same same side of it you know I I'm you know their their son is not here and I am right um 
you know, but regardless of the fact, you know, I, I have a sense of pride and all the boys that were there that night have a sense of pride, you know, that, Hey, you know, regardless of whether you like us or hate us, you know, we brought them home and, yeah. you know, we're willing to accept, you know, your anger or, or frustration at the situation, you know, that's just the way it is on the survivor side of it. Right. Right. Yeah. You, I mean, you can't blame people for their emotions and yeah. their circumstances you know so how did uh how did you end up finishing out your career after getting shot up pretty badly uh i spent six months on uh battalion staff and running the s2 shop and then uh, we had an incident happen where uh we had to relieve a platoon sergeant in one of the companies and so i ended up moving over to snipers for my last year and uh, was running the sniper platoon for the last year, and, and then uh, I was on the sniper range. We were uh, out in eastern Washington, um, shooting on a Department of Energy range over there. And you know, the company commander, the first sergeant, come over, and you know, offsite training is always fun because everybody gets to be out of the office. So you know, I'm hobbling around and, and kind of dragging my leg. And the first sergeant's like, Hey, you're going to see a specialist when we get back. And so I went and saw the specialist and he kind of just laid it out, you know, bluntly for me. Uh, he goes, do you want to walk when you're 40? And I said, well, yeah. And he goes, well, then you need to stop now. And so, you know, that started the whole, uh, you know, med board process. And so then I was out of the army about six months later Wow. Wow. So I know a lot of guys that take some a year or two or three to get out, but because I wasn't on uh, any kind of pain medication or, or any of that stuff, um, you know, it was, they didn't have to, you know, worry about substance abuse or any of that. And so um, it, my packet kind of went a little bit faster than, than some of the other guys, some of the other guys from, uh, they had gotten shot that deployment, you know, we're still in for another year or so, even after I got out because they had to get, you know, through kind of a, uh, I don't want to say rehab process, but, you know, they kind of had to get weaned off the meds yeah, yeah. and, you know, and finish the, the rehabbing and, and stuff. Yeah, I also, uh, I noticed it in your book. You also, are you involved with uh, Gallant Few? I know that you have the postscript for them. Um, they, I'm, I'm friends with, uh, you know, some of the guys that, that do Gallant Few, uh, Tim Abel, and um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on, Carl Monger. on some of the others. But it was one of those yeah. things. Yeah, Carl Monger. Good dude. And so yeah. it was one of those things that, he Carl asked me if we would put that in there, and I said I will most definitely gladly, you know, put that in there um, to kind of help, you know, all the fellows out. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, since it's in your book, uh, hey folks, if you have a, a spare five bucks this month or whatever, why don't you uh, head over to Gallant Few? And... Yeah, I, I I haven't spoken to Carl in a while, and probably I should correct that. But he he's a good guy, and Gallant Few does a yeah. lot to, to help guys out. But yeah. it's it's yeah, uh, no, Gallant they Few. They really do. Yeah, Gallant Gallant Few dot org. Uh, check them out. Throw them a buck or two. You know. So I know we've kept you for a while here, uh, Nick, but uh, let's hit up these user questions real quick. Yeah, we've only got a couple. Uh, one uh, from Jackson. Thank you very much. Uh, did you ever work with any of the tier one units, Delta, SEAL Team 6, uh, HRT, and if so, which impressed you the most of the bunch and why? Um, I worked with all of them, you know, in, in some aspect or another. Um, I, I lean towards, you know, I, I did enjoy working with um, Delta Force a little bit more. Um, and a lot of it is just because there's kind of this, I don't know, um, you know, and, and all the tier elements have their own personality. And, you know, we kind of sometimes fit better with guys in Delta Force because uh, especially early on, you know, a lot of the team leaders and squad leaders and, and guys, you know, the, the career progression is you know, from the Ranger Regiment is to go to that organization. So there is a familiarity with people who understand where you're coming from as a unit or an organization, whereas we didn't really have that for a while with Team Six. And so we always kind of got looked at as like the kid brother thing. 
And then uh, as far as the HRT, I've only worked with a few guys from there. And that was in the kind of middle part of Iraq. Um, you know, it was only a select few. And that was to kind of, we were building the terrorist database with the, you know, the three letter agencies for, you know, Homeland Security and whatnot. Um, so as far as that goes, but then, you know, everybody's, they're all a great bunch of guys. I mean, I know, you know, in certain aspects, you know, we all talk trash on each other because we can, and, you know, it's a cultural thing. And if you're not a part of the culture, then sometimes it look, gets looked at as unprofessional, but right. You know, uh, you read enough seal books and they take cheap shots on us. And wow. so this, some of this was, a, you know, a chance to, you know, level the field, if you will, and take a few <laughs> shots at them. And so, yeah. Uh, Crash some shade down. If that's you right. want to call me unprofessional, then, you know, <clears throat> then so be it but yeah um ohms uh, thank you for the donation so ohms gave us a sticker and i'm not and it, ohms later comments that sticker didn't work out right dang so i don't the sticker is either somebody raising us up and worshiping us or i'll, I'll go with it or it's uh it's um I, I don't know. It's uh, like holding up a new baby. I'm not sure, but I, I, I'm going to go with the word. I'll go, thing. With, I'll go the, with that. Yeah. That the, the, the three of us, that. the four of us, including D, the four of us are are the new pantheon for ohms. Um, hey, can we take like a five minute break? Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, go ahead, man. We're, we'll I, pull I got a cramp. Yep. Got a cramp going on. Yep, yep. All yeah, right, sure. Thanks. Yep. Um, yeah, so guys, uh, next episode is going to be, hold on a second, I'll tease this out here. Uh, okay, so on the third, actually, we have an extra episode that we crammed in here. James Laporta, who is an investigative journalist with the Associated Press, he is also a former Marine, and he's uh, broken some of the stories about, what's that guy's name, Majewski? Uh, Guy running for Congress? Yeah. Who's a stolen? I should oh, say I, should, I, should, valor, I dude. shouldn't say he's a stolen valor he guy. He 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 actually did serve, but but it's still stolen valor if you say that you did top secret deployments and you didn't. My, like depo my deployments are classified. Yeah, is, that's still yeah, like I think that's still stolen valor. Yeah, I don't know. Little... We'll let you guys vote whether it's stolen valor or not. <laughs> but if a dude makes stuff stuff about his military career, that's kind of not uh, cool. Stolen valor ish. And then next Friday uh, is uh, Tim Weiner. Uh, Tim is a journalist. He wrote, uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, he's written some pretty definitive histories of the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI. Um, and a history of political warfare between America and Russia. So uh, that'll be a pretty interesting conversation, I think. And then on the 10th, another extra episode, uh, Joan Barker. Uh, and she was... Uh, facilitating some of the aviation foreign internal defense in Afghanistan. And uh, in both Tim and Joan, they will be in studio interviews. And so will, on the 14th, John Fox, who, um, he was a Marine, and he worked at, or he, he went and he became an international volunteer with the YPG in Syria. And he, he wrote this book that I, I'm almost done with it now. He wrote a book about, it's co-authored him and two other guys who are foreign volunteers and, uh, and fought with the Kurds in Syria against ISIS. Um, so it's a pretty fascinating book. I think it'll be a good interview. Good stuff. Good stuff. And if you haven't joined our Patreon, join our Patreon. Like, hook us up. Uh, hook yourselves up. There's a ton of bonus content on there. Like I said, you get to see John, uh, Jack and I in our, I said smoking pajamas earlier. I meant smoking jackets. Smoking but jackets. But we keep it casual. We don't have we smoking keep it, jackets we quite We keep it yet. really casual. But. Um, and our waifu pillows. <laughs> um, <laughs> that we, have the, we have the humidor and the cigars are on their way. So we'll see who wants to uh, smoke it up. Yeah. Um, Nicholas. Uh, Thanks so much, man, for for spending a Friday night with us. We we really appreciate. Yeah, uh, <laughs> quick qu quick one from well, one I of our. I appreciate you guys having me. One one of our uh, one of our Patreon users asks uh, if um, since you were in two seven five, did you ever serve with Pat Tillman and, and his brother? Uh, yeah, I mean they were in Alpha Company, and I was in Bravo Company and Charlie Company. But yeah, they were Kevin and Pat were both there at the same time. Do I know them? Not really. I okay. mean, 
I know him about as well as I, you know, know Matt best, which is I, I know who he is and I know he was an alpha company and, you know, that's about where it's at. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So everybody, some great, great war stories. Uh, I mean, on the ground stuff for, for so many things that have happened during the GWAT, uh, firsthand accounts. Run to the sound of the guns. Check it out. Get it on, you know, we say Amazon. The, li the link is down in the, the description. The down below. Um, but yeah, uh, we highly recommend it. Check it out. Uh, do you have anything that you want to plug? Any, uh, aside from Gallant Few, are you involved in any charities or organizations or businesses that you want to plug? Anything that you want to do? Not, not currently, you know. Um, uh, no. I'm not involved in, in anything. I'm just a you know, uh, retired guy who, who got conned into writing the book, if you will. And uh, <laughs> well, you know, people ask me, you know, hey, would you would you write another one? And I was like, no, because if I had <laughs> known what it was going to take to write the first one, I would not have even written that one. Um, yeah, it's a great book. Tons of references. A lot of great pictures, too, which is something, you know, you, you see a lot of pictures in Vietnam era books, but you don't see a lot of pictures. I think in like modern GWAP books a lot of times, which is, I think it's, it's really cool. You know, it's something that uh, a lot of really interesting and that one of your wound, I've never seen a pump like that. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, actually it does suck because it's a wound back. <laughs> yeah. So it's so sucking, sucking out all there the extra fluids and whatever. But I'm uh, <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, Nick, so much. You know, again, I really appreciate it. Appreciate your family's patience with us uh, while we suck you away on, on a Friday. Um, and, you know, if there's anything, you know, we can do, um, feel free to reach out anytime and hope to talk to you, talk to you again soon. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Take care. Thank Take you, care, everyone, who joined us. We'll see you next Friday. Or we'll see you before that with, uh, with James on